Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Turmel, and I founded the New Poppers Party of Ontario during this election. And I'm going to participate in the leaders' debate that was on TVO, the undemocratic debate with only three party leaders getting all of the free time. So I'm going to tear apart their arguments and have a lot of fun with the fact that they don't know what to do. And before I get started, I'm going to insert the two-minute tape that I've made available for the media explaining our programs of how the Argentine solution would work to solve our problems in Ontario, financial problems. Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer, founder of the new Poppers Party, and we're not ashamed of being poor because we know it's a stacked deck. Do you remember back in 2001 when Argentina went broke? Well, by 2006, they managed to pay off all their foreign debt. How'd they do that? I'll tell you. The unions, rather than be laid off, all their employees, they said, I'll tell you what you're going to do, you're going to pay us with small denomination bonds. Now, who in Ontario wouldn't take a $10 bond that they can use to pay hydro, their taxes, their license fees? Everybody would take it. So just like that in Argentina, everybody took those bonds as a new form of currency. They kept all the unions employed, hired more people, and pulled their way out of debt. You need paychecks to have jobs. Can't have jobs without paychecks. So it would work like a PayPal Ontario, where you can buy in and open an account for these credits, not only with your visa, but also with 100 hours of labor. And you can also pay it back, not only with cash, but with 100 hours of labor. And that's how you can store your labor in a provincial time bank, and everybody can end up with a job. So our pauper's ethos is, we want no cops and gambling, sex or drugs or rock and roll. We want no usury on loans. Pay cash or time. No dole. So what can you do on your own? Well, in 1999, I traveled Europe and paid for 39 nights out of 40 with an IOU for a night back in Canada worth five hours. In France, they pay themselves 60 green francs an hour. In Germany, 20 green marks an hour. In Canada, 12 green dollars per hour. But between countries, we trade hours. Time banking endorsed at the United Nations, the Unilats resolution. So if you want to know how to set up your own time bank account online, person to person, just find Uniset, Unilets, and join the underground economy. This message is authorized by the CFO of the Popper Party of Ontario. Okay, so here we go, the Ontario leadership debate on TVO. Good evening, everybody from Toronto. I'm Steve Payton. In just nine days, we'll be voting in an Ontario election. Tonight, we're hoping to get a clear view of where the major party leaders stand on some of the important issues. And notice that these are the same parties that they always hear about in Parliament all the time anyway. And I guess they're expecting something new, but that's the definition of insanity, expecting the same actions to have a different result by debating those issues. And let me introduce you to the leaders. Dalton McGinty is the leader of the Ontario Liberals. Now, Dalton and I go back a long way. He's an Ottawa boy, so he heard me talking about provincial bonds for the last 25 years. Andrea Horvat is the leader of Ontario's New Democratic Party. And I ran in the by-election where she got elected so that we uh, had that debate and she heard about provincial bonds then too. And Tim Hudak is the leader of Ontario's Progressive Conservatives. And he's the only guy who's never heard about provincial bonds yet. The leaders know the rules of the debate, they have agreed to them, and they've asked me to enforce them. We asked Ontarians to send us questions over the last few weeks, and we got about a thousand of them. And they get to pick which ones get discussed. We chose six, and the six we picked reflected those issues you wanted to see debated the most. The leaders will hear and see them for the first time at the same time you do. The first one-on-one -on -one debate will be between Mr. Hudak and Mr. McGinty. Mr. Hudak will respond to the question first, which is about jobs. Roll tape, please. Now remember, you can't have jobs without paychecks. So they're going to talk about attracting jobs while really they should th be thinking about attracting paychecks. Where's the money for paychecks going to come from? So I really enjoy these jobs seekers who aren't really looking for paychecks. My name is Catherine Balfour and I'm from Pickering, Ontario. 
My question is about college and university grads who are forced to take minimum wage part-time jobs or even leave Ontario and Canada to find full-time employment. How would you help these grads find full-time gainful employment in Ontario? And of course, coming up with paychecks is the answer overall. Okay, Tim, who knocked you up first? Well, you know, it's tough being a, a young student today. You have significant debts when you're coming out of college yeah, or tough. university and entering one of the worst job markets in memory. Yeah, tough. You know, I was at Conestoga College just the other day, and I asked the students there who are in an apprenticeship training program how many of their friends were heading out west to Alberta, Saskatchewan to get a job. And you know what? Almost every one of them raised their hands. I want to be premier to make sure that Ontario is the best place in all of Canada to get a good job. The so he wants to make it the best place in Canada to get a good job without yet coming up with paychecks. The kind of job would be the ticket to the middle class where you can raise a family and buy a home, not the part-time low-wage jobs that Mr. McGinty is taking credit for. We have a five-point jobs plan to make Ontario number one Canada for jobs, particularly for our young graduates. Mr. McGinty, you want it? Sure, by all means. I want to thank you very much. Five for points. <laughs> uh, these are very uncertain times in the global economy. And the truth is, though, that Canada fares pretty well. And within Canada, Ontario is doing quite well as well. Since January, we've created more jobs in Ontario than the rest of the country combined. You know, it's been said that we can't build the future for our young people, but we can build our young people for the future. That's why we're putting such a heavy emphasis on educating our young people. That's why one important part of our plan is to reduce tuition by 30%. That means $1,600 less for university tuition and $730 less for college tuition. And he'll tax you more to pay for it otherwise. The fact of the matter is we continue to create jobs in Ontario and we've got some great plans to get us there and I look forward to talking more about that this evening. You know, Okay, so the point is, they've got plans to create some jobs in Ontario, not all jobs. Now, the provincial bond idea lets all necessary jobs that we find need be done be financed with paychecks, right? So, we're always going to be dealing with their limitations, how they say, oh, we can do some or more, but they can never do them all. The problem is I'm hearing the opposite when I'm talking to students who are saying that it's awfully difficult to get a job, no matter what the tuition may be. It's awfully difficult to get a paycheck, no matter what the tuition may be. 300,000 manufacturing jobs have been lost under your watch. In July, Ontario lost more jobs than all the other provinces combined. <laughs> Complete contradictions, eh? How they cherry-pick their numbers to say what they want to say. So we need a change of course. One that says to young people that Conestoga, at Confederation, at Brock, or U of T, that Ontario will be the best place again to get a good job. All right. So, let's say Ontario's the best place. You've got no idea how, but by saying so, it'll make it so. So our plan, five-point job plan and change book. Oh, good. And you can see the change book docs here. But here's the bottom line. Yeah. One, to treat energy policy as economic policy, not a social program. So businesses will have the incentives to hire and expand again. Number two, to drain this swamp of red tape that bogs down any small business leader trying to get things done in the economy. Third, we're going to create 200,000 skilled trades positions by modernizing our apprenticeship system. Four, we're going to lower... So without coming up with new paychecks, he's going to create all these jobs. ...for business taxes down 10% to encourage businesses to hire and create jobs in Ontario. That's it. He's not going to come up with new paychecks, but he's going to come up with encouragement for businesses to create new jobs by getting paychecks. And fifth and finally, unlike my opponents, we'll give families relief, the confidence to spend in the economy again. And that's why we'll take the HST off heat, off your hydro bill, and bring in an income tax cut targeted particularly at middle class families who are being squeezed. So it's going to create all these new jobs and cut taxes too. <laughs> all right, you may not be surprised to learn that uh, we've got a jobs plan as well, but it's a little bit different from yours. Coincidentally, does because. Okay. He's got no cash either, but he's got a jobs plan. It's just the five points as well. 
and it starts by creating the most competitive workforce in the world. I see. So the goal is what we have to start getting done. We're already very close to that right now. We've got the highest educated workforce among the 34 OECD countries. And the highest educated unemployed workforce. We're 20% higher, for example, in the U.S. and twice as high as the U.K. in terms of the number of our adults who have achieved a college, uni uh, university, or apprenticeship certification. Sure, half our McDonald's hamburger deliveries have university degrees. Beyond that, of course, we do want to have competitive taxes here, and we continue to lower, lower them. In fact, we've recently lowered them for families by $355. Here's where I part company in a decided way with my colleague, Mr. Hudak. I think it's very important for us to invest in the clean energy sector. And he should invest there as soon as he finds some money. But he hasn't come up with the money yet. But he wants to invest there. I think it's a great opportunity. I think we need to see that opportunity. We're number one in North America now when it comes to producing cars. I want us to be number one in North America when it comes to producing clean energy technology. That's where the world is going. I want yeah, we want all these things too. Ontario to be there first in North America. You know, Mr. Regan, your jobs plan has been a failure. 300,000 lost manufacturing jobs. Our resource sector has been decimated. It is the most difficult job market for young people leaving school today to find a good job. And you're both... <laughs> That's right, eh? With no paychecks, nobody able to, is able to find jobs. Posting about low-wage part-time jobs, trying to take credit for that. Sir, your green energy jobs are nothing more than a shell game. You promised us we'd pay higher hydro rates and we get all these jobs and new power. Well, we got the higher hydro bills all right, but the jobs never came and the power is only one quarter of one percent despite the billions of dollars that you sunk into it. Well, it's well, not well, we all know Mr. McGinty, that. higher energy bills, Mr. McGinty's job. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, I, 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 I part company with my colleague in this as well. The fact of the matter is that when it comes to our electricity system and our hydro bills, we have begun a major rebuild of the system. We just scraped by in the summer of 2003 because the previous government had not made new investment in new generation. They didn't have any money either. So we're making massive investments in new generation, transmission lines, and then of course there's a cost associated with that. There's no escaping that. But when it comes to building a stronger economy and ensuring that we get international investment coming into Ontario and creating jobs here for our young people, it's very important that we have a healthy, vital electricity system in place. And it help families with their cost, we're taking 10% off our electricity bills. That I just want to point out that back in 1993, North York Hydro issued hydropower dollars certificates that people would come and buy and give to their friends. Well, there's an alternate currency, hydropower dollars. Same idea as being able to use provincial bonds to pay your hydro. So that idea has been around a while. Ontario Hydro actually did it once, just didn't do it well. All they had to do was pay their employees with it. That's the end of the one-on-one -on -one segment. We now bring Ms. Horvath into the mix as well. Anything here you've heard you want to pick up on? Well, I actually want to go back to what Catherine uh, was saying in her question, and I'm so glad that uh, Catherine brought this question forward because... All right, she's glad the question. They always spend time there, wasted. It's the exact same conversation that I had about two months ago at the YWCA in Hamilton when a couple of women and I were in the change room and they were talking about the fact that their, their adult children had been to university. They got their degree couldn't get a job in their field, so they went to college. Couldn't find a paycheck. Got their diploma, still couldn't get a job. And in both cases of these women, their kids were working in hospitality, waiting tables, trying to pay off mountainous student debts. This is not the, the way that uh, it should be in Ontario. Agreed, this is not the way it should be. Students deserve a chance at- Yes, they do. After university after college, and they deserve a chance without a mountain of debt on their backs. And that's why our plan is not about the tax giveaways that these guys talk about. The blank checks to companies that don't create jobs, jobs have not worked. In the last 10 years, we've given $20 billion away. Our plan, give a tax cut to the companies that create jobs. Give a tax break to the companies that train their workers on the workforce. Give a tax break to the companies that are investing in their plant and machinery, and you'll create the kind of jobs that will be there, not just for new Canadians, but for young people and Follow people that have been laid off. We all agree, you know, let's provide paychecks for jobs, useful jobs. All sunshine and apple pie. 
But I think it's important to like, take a look at, at the facts. And the fact is, we are the best job creator in the country right now. Mr. Since the January, fact is, since Mr. January the we've fact created is, more jobs in Ontario than the rest of the country combined. Mr. McGinty, June the was so good, we people. created more jobs in Ontario than the entire United Mr. States of America. The fact is, Mr. McGinty, so that your plan is progress. actually failing because the biggest issue on the mind of students these days is jobs. Young people don't have jobs. And that's right, they're looking for jobs, knowing that without any money around, they can't create any jobs, but they're going to keep looking. That is the problem. And you've <laughs> had eight years in office, and those jobs are not, are not well, coming to Ontario. And was. so the, the question I think that Catherine asked about... Here, jobs, 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 come to Ontario. ...was how are our young people going to get jobs? Your plan has failed. All right, so what is the answer? How are young people going to get jobs? Well you got to find paychecks first, right? And you got to have money to create paychecks, right? And if there's no money out there, you can't create jobs, can you, right? And you better learn how to create your own money or you're never going to get a job, right? So, yeah, they're all stumped by the fact they got no money to create jobs. And they're looking to create more jobs, even though they've got no money. And, oh, that's wonderfully enthusiastic of them to be out there looking to create jobs, even though they've got no money. But I focus on fixing why there's no money and providing a new source of money like they did in Argentina. So the Argentine solution is it, and these people are clueless, you can see. Far. What we need is a change in direction. Ah, what we need. Famous words you'll see all night. We need the kind of change that puts young people first and that puts jobs first. Mr. Okay, so what we need is a change that ends up with this goal. Not how to get there, but... Yeah, and then Mr. McGinn, Mr. Jack, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't know how you can say that things are going well in Ontario today. In July, we lost more jobs in Ontario than the rest of the provinces can... And McGinty said in June, <laughs> they made more jobs than the rest of the provinces combined, right? <laughs> Fine. August, we lost more. And I was down in Cornwall the other day. I met with a young man named Ryan. And Ryan desperately wants to be an electrician. That's what he wants to be in life. And he's working at Walmart. He's got a part-time job. At least he's paying the bills. But it's not what he wants to do. And he wants to be an electrician. And that's why our plan will create 200,000 more skilled trades positions. They've got a plan. they got no money. But this plan will create 200 skilled paid positions without any money. For young apprentices like Ryan. He even has an employer, but he can't get the job with the employer because you are keeping an old apprenticeship system from the 1970s. We'll take it into the 21st century, move to a one-to-one -one ratio, and create 200,000 more skilled jobs for young people like Ryan. And then when he gets into power, he goes, oops, can't find any money, sorry. If you want to get a job for Ryan, who's an electrician, then you should do what David Suzuki's doing and support my clean energy plan. I see, I see. Don't come up with paychecks, support his plan. It's creating thousands and thousands of jobs. I would invite you, go visit those people working in those, in those industries, whether you're going to London, or Fort Erie, or Cambridge, or Cornwall, or Ottawa, yeah, yeah, or Mississauga, yeah, yeah, or Scarborough, yeah, yeah, or Sault Ste. Yeah, Marie, yeah, or Thunder yeah. Bay, all kinds of jobs but popping up. You had to for your, your photo op. There's a really the good media went there. Jobs are popping up. The next day, I want us to be the best in North America when it comes to producing clean energy technology. He wants us to be best. Cheerleader. Oh, that's what's in our grasp right now. That's where the world is going. Last year, for the first time, for the very first time, more money was spent globally in clean energy technologies than in fossil fuels. Mr. McGinty, it's, good to, know that you've actually, to it's good to know that you've actually uh, been to Thunder Bay recently. In fact, uh, Mr. Gulak and I were there not too long ago, and we missed you. We missed you when we were in Thunder Bay having that uh, debate about a week ago. But I have to say, when I go to Thunder Bay, people are talking about the good jobs. People are talking about the fact that 40,000 direct and indirect forestry jobs are now gone from Ontario, that you've allowed the forestry industry to, cla to collapse. In fact, I, I met with a, a gentleman in Dubreville. I don't know if you know... All right, she's going to tell us how bad things are. Dubreville is. It's not too far from Wawa. And that fellow told me that his 
family is now three generations in Duberville, and because the mill is closed, because of your forestry tenure process, uh, the mill is not going to reopen, and there is not going to be a fourth generation of his family in that town, uh, because there's nothing there for his kids. That's what Northerners are saying, that's what Northwesterners are saying. And now she's going to tell us what she'd do about it. About what you've done, and that's why we want to make sure that our natural resources are processed here in Ontario, giving jobs to Ontarians. Okay, she's going to make sure. That's part of our job. You, you know the plant in Fort Erie recently laid people off. You got a bit of controversy because the solar plant you went to to claim was your flagship when the meeting went there the next day. Nobody was working. You promised us more jobs for higher and higher hydro bills. Well, we got the higher hydro bills, but the jobs never came. You said that already. You have a failed course. You've chased jobs out of the province. We can't afford Dalton McGinty anymore. He chased the jobs out of the province, you know, <laughs> with a whip. Jeez. And that's when we brought in a five-point jobs plan, make Ontario the best place to get a good job, a ticket to the middle class. <laughs> He's got a plan to make it the best, cheerleader. Lowering taxes for businesses, more skilled trades in our apprenticeship system, and peeling back this regulatory burden that handcuffs businesses large and small. I want to get out of their way. I want to get behind them, help them create jobs, not... Philip uses paper. That's what he wants. Tax less, spend more. Well, you know, Mr. Hedak says he wants to create jobs. Samsung, I mean, the great news about Ontario, there's all kinds of great news about Ontario, notwithstanding what you say, is that after California, we're the second most favorite place in North America for the world to invest. So we've worked really hard to draw that investment in here. Samsung is one of them. Ah, draw investment here. Since he doesn't know how to come up with his own cash, he has to get investment drawn here from loan sharks overseas. They all do. Both companies. They're saying they want to invest $7 billion in Ontario. And we're going to own eight. And create four manufacturing plants and 16,000 jobs over the course of six years. But Mr. McGee, that's something that's that's something that we've got here right now. I know we're that contract. Mr. McGee, you are private you're private. Let me finish the sentence please and then we'll get the you would tear up that contract and you would kill those jobs. That's something we've got happening here right now. One of the responsibilities of leadership is to find an opening and run through it. We know the world is going to clean energy. We know that the price of oil and gas is only going to go up. We know the price of technologies always come down. Take your flat screen TV and your computers. Why can't we be first at this in Ontario? But well, with flat screen TVs, to be clear. First. why can't we be first? Oh, we got no money. That's why. Several thousand dollars a, a year. Two thousand People jobs. Them. They waited for the price to come down. It should be an affordable, competitive process. And here's the problem. We agree. It should be. You think higher energy bills create jobs? Higher energy bills have actually killed jobs in Ontario. You know, Other jurisdictions have done it. That point. For every well, we three, you on that point. for every that. job that's created a subsidized job, three, four, or five jobs are left elsewhere, and that's why we have 500,000 women and men who will be out on the pavement tomorrow looking for a job in Ontario. Last year, in the city, in the And I would agree with Mr. Hudak that Mr. McGinty's uh, private power deals have uh, have caused us a, a, a problem in Ontario in terms of the lack of uh, lack of competitiveness in the electricity. Uh, uh, system, uh, but I disagree with both of these gentlemen uh, when they talk about uh, blank checks to companies that ship jobs out of Ontario. That's not going to help Catherine's uh, child get a job. That's not going to create jobs. It hasn't done so for the past ten years. All right, so she's an expert on what doesn't work. Where twenty billion dollars has gone in blank checks. That's why tax credits for the companies that are creating jobs, investing in their, their uh, plant and machinery, uh, training their workers, reward the companies that are doing those things. Don't give blank checks to companies that are shipping jobs somewhere else. Okay, that's... Now, I have to do the explanation of the problem, which is everybody, all corporations, all governments, borrow from the banks. I call them the pump house. They get new credits, 10, dump it in the economic pool, and everybody's got to bring back 11 to settle their debts. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of splashing happens in the pool. Who taxes from here, puts it over there, taxes from there, puts it over there. It's just splashing in the pool, and it doesn't uh, answer the imbalance in the pump house. So, oh, you're going to hear a lot of this about, we'll take the money from here and savings from there and put it over there. But usually they just say, like Hudak, oh, I want to cut taxes and I want to raise services. So, 
the last word for question one. We now move on to question two. That segment was about jobs. We now have our second question. Let's roll tape, please. Hi, my name is Majed Abu Adela. I'm from Guelph, Ontario. My question is, how each political leader would cut government spending, by how much, and in which areas? Thank you. Okay, this All right. segment will feature off the top, Andrea Horvath against Tim Hudak, then Mr. McGinty comes in later. Ms. Horvath. Well, Majet uh, raises a question that's on everybody's mind uh, these days, and I think it's important to uh, uh, to recognize that as a as a mom and as a, a person who has to balance her uh, her checkbook every single month, uh, I know how important it is to make sure that we get rid of the deficit in Ontario, and I have a plan to do that. In fact. She knows we have big problems, she's got a plan. Let's hear it. My plan is uh, very upfront, very well costed, and it very clearly shows uh, that in rolling back the wrong-headed uh, blank checks that these two gentlemen prefer, uh, we're going to be able to uh, switch that investment in, in different ways. We're going to give families a break, because I believe that the family budget is extremely important. Splash over here. We're going to reward the companies that are creating jobs and, and getting Ontario back to work. Splash we'll over there. We're the budget by 2017-18, but we'll be doing it in a very uh, uh, reasonable way, uh, a way that's uh, prudent, a uh, way that's uh, practical, uh, but in a way that makes sure uh, that we're changing the priorities to put jobs first, to put people first, and get our economy back on track. Now, the problem with balancing the budget is that you always have to pay the interest to the pump house first and then make do with the rest. So whenever people promise a balanced budget, they're going to be doing vicious cuts because they're the ones who are going to have to be imposing the shortages after they've paid the rake off to the loan sharks. Okay. Well, Michelle, you know, the problem is that we have a government today that... All right, you'll tell us the problem. ...has not set priorities. And they're trying to be all things to all people. Okay, it's got to do with priorities. In the last eight years, under Dolph McGinty, the economy has grown by a total of 10%. It's not a great record. Those are the facts. And government spending has increased by 80%. And they asked him, Jed, is your health care system 80% better? Are your roads 80% better? So much of that has been wasted and hasn't gone into the front line. So here's what we need to do. You can't run your house like that, you can't run a business like that, and you cannot continue to run the province of Ontario like that. So we'll... Well, actually, everybody does run it like that. They shouldn't, but all families are in debt up to here, and all corporations are in debt up to here, and governments too. So, to say that you can't run government in the same stupid lunatic way that you run corporations and families is silly because you're all in the same bind and it's called Mort Gage Death Gamble. You signed it, time to die. Set priorities, health and education. We'll invest more in those areas, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, splash from here to put it over there. And find savings of two cents in every dollar outside of those areas. Ah, he's going to go find savings. <laughs> and the other thing we need to do, the other thing we need to do is where that two cent savings is coming from. I mean, I think it's uh, important. <laughs> two cents they're talking about. It's important that Ontarians get an understanding uh, from this leadership debate of exactly how you're going to achieve those savings because it's easy to put that down on paper. But unless you're prepared to show them where the money is, uh, they're not going to, uh, to believe it. It's Imagine her calling him on where the money is when she hasn't been able to explain it once. So the idea is, you know, give them something that they can trust in, not just promises that, uh, that don't have anything to back them up. That's why our plan is costed. It's very clear. We show very clearly how we're going to not only achieve the savings, but change the priorities to put people first, to put jobs first, to take the pressure off small business by reducing the small business tax, to make sure families have money in their pockets again. And we do it. By, uh, by rolling back those wrong-headed tax cuts that both of you guys fig uh, uh So by splashing it from here to over there, it's going to fix everything. Uh, prefer. Instead, what we're going to do is reward companies that create jobs. We think that's the better way to go. Well, here, here's the reality. It's a matter of setting priorities. Health and education will be ours. Bigger splashes over there. Invest will increase in those areas. We'll find savings of two cents in every dollar just like families and businesses have been doing. This guy isn't even a nickel-dimer. The other thing, Majed, if we want to get out of this hole, 
We need the economy firing all cylinders. We need people working again in the province of Ontario. And with half a million unemployed women and men sending their resumes out today, we need them working in good private sector jobs. The more people who are working, the more revenue coming to the Treasury. The more people working, the better things are. And he's in favor of more people working. Just got no paychecks. And that's why I object to Ms. Horvath's plan that's going to increase taxes on businesses. But that doesn't help. Higher taxes under Ms. Horvath, higher personal taxes under Mr. McGinty, they'll kill jobs. No. So, he likes splashes over here, but that'll kill jobs over there. And she likes splashes over there, but that'll kill jobs over here. And he likes splashes over there, that'll kill jobs over there. What can they do? They're all splashing in the pool, but they ain't got enough money to settle at the pump house. I'm the only party, yes, fact, the Duda, party will actually be create clear. jobs. Let's be clear, Mr. Really. Mr. Harper is already reducing taxes, corporate taxes significantly. And with our rolling back of the tax cut that Mr. McGinty and you favor, we are still going to be in a very competitive uh, position. We are going to be lower than the Great Lakes state average. We're going to be lower than Japan. We're already in a very competitive state. And by taking the tax rate back to 14%, we're still going to be very competitive with our, our jurisdictions that are abiding us. And, and we don't need to give that blank check to those companies because for, for 10 years, that $20 billion in blank checks has not brought us the jobs. So let's focus and reward the companies that are creating jobs, that are investing in Ontario, that are training their workforce. There was a bad splash over there. And then we'll have uh, the kind of economy uh, and the kind of province that puts the priority on people and jobs. Notice they just say, and then we'll have our goal but never explain how. Sure, they're bad, but it didn't explain how we're good. Ah. Well, here's a difference. I mean, we <sighs> Low-tech leaders. Sure, you said for the leaders, the big you and I, Mr. McGinty chose not to join us in the North. I just don't understand why increasing taxes on having to be Bowwater, on Weyerhaeuser in Northern Ontario, on Valley Inco, how that's going to be helpful in creating the jobs that we need in the province. I, I think we need... Yeah, I mean, he doesn't like where she's dipping for her splashes, and then she doesn't like where he's dipping for his splashes. <laughs> it's not Relief. your tax rate that's the problem. You, you said it at the beginning of the debate. It's the electricity he, rates he, that are the problem, and I think be, we heard that that He needs to be allowed to finish his day. And that's why we brought forward a jobs plan to get energy rates under control. Five points. To lower taxes for businesses and to clear aside the regulatory burden that holds businesses back, large and small, and a, and a big difference. We need people to have the confidence to spend again to create jobs. And that's why the Ontario PC Party and Changebook will give average families relief. We'll take the HST off heat, we'll take it off hydro, and the debt return to the public. Splash, splash, splash. Well, and an income tax cut for middle class families who are really getting... Splash, if bribery. If ability to spend on hockey skates for the kids, home repair, That'll create jobs in Brampton, in Niagara, and in Northern Ontario. Okay, that is the end of the one-on-one -on -one segment, and I, as I invite Dalton McGinty to join us. So, they're going to create all these jobs without coming up with any new money. Want to bet? I'm reminded that the question said, what government spending are you going to cut by how much and in which areas? <laughs> kind of neat the way they completely ducked today. Eh? That was the very specific question. Ah, but each one accused and pointed out the other one's suggested cuts. Not sure we've heard an answer to that yet. Go ahead. <laughs> I want to thank uh, uh, Majid for that a very important question. Thank you for that important question as he's trying to figure out what to say. And I think it's something that weighs heavily on the minds of many people around. More wasted gibberish, yeah. The uh, instability that's in the global economy today is not because of... Ah, it's the world economy that's the problem. That's why he's screwing up. A lack of confidence in financial institutions because of a lack of confidence in governments and their ability to manage the money. Here in Canada, we have a stellar reputation globally. And within Canada, here in Ontario, as I say, we're the biggest job producer in the country. Here are some specifics. We are reducing the size of the Ontario public service by 7%. That's nearly 5,000 positions. And I want to add positions by paying people with provincial bonds. Remember, in Argentina, they didn't have to lay anybody off. I mean, these klutzes think that you're going to have better services with less people working for you. It doesn't work that way. You have to keep the unions fully employed and you got to have them hire more. So here he is talking about creating all these jobs while he's cutting back on civil service jobs.
splashing in the pool, right? Taking from the civil servants' paychecks, putting them in other paychecks. Splashing in the pool. We're a little more than halfway there already. That'll save us $500 million. Beyond that, we're going to find another $200 million in savings. He's going to find it. <laughs> inside our government agencies, boards. You have to wonder why he hasn't found it in the last eight years in power. And commissions. We're also very much aware that in health care, there are better ways for us to deliver health care. Oh, he's discovered this after eight years in power. And that takes me to part of our plan going forward. Oh, he's got a plan to go forward that isn't, hasn't started for eight years. Instead of having our seniors, our parents and grandparents, go into long-term care homes or in a hospital setting, we should do what we want to do is what they want us to do. We're going to provide more home care in the home. We're going to bring house calls back. And we're going to pro provide a new tax credit, $1,500. For a senior. Fifteen hundred bucks. You think that's going to get you much care? Well, in Japan, they have the Furuyukipu Health Care Time Bank, where people can put in hours helping your local hospitals, register those hours, and when they need care, they can call on those hours, so they don't seem to have a problem. So here we go, Mr. No Money. To make renovations to their home, to make it friendlier for them, safer, accessible. It might mean uh, a ramp instead of stick. Yes, if only he had some money to pay for it. Stairs or, or one of those stair lifts that takes you up to the second floor. Yes, exactly what I could do for you with provincial bonds. Or, or a walk-in tunnel. Oh, wouldn't that be so nice that I can do it for you and he'd like for you to have it? Excuse me, uh, Ms. Reed, you actually had eight years to try to implement those kinds All right. of programs. And it's All right, good shot, right? Eight years, why hasn't he done it yet? It's kind of frustrating when we have seniors right now in Ontario who are, have been living together for 65 years of marriage and are being told they have to go into separate long-term care homes. That's not the kind of health care, that's not the kind of long-term care solution uh, that we need in Ontario. But okay, she knows what we don't need. But I think I did answer uh, Medjet's question uh, by saying what, what we're going to do is make sure that uh, the, uh, the wasteful... Uh, okay, she's going to make sure. Uh, ...spending of money towards giving these uh, these flag checks to corporations is going to be rolled back. That's All right, splashing from over there, that's where she'll get the money over here. That's a significant amount of, uh, of room that that gives us uh, in terms of the budget. We're also going to change the priority in health care. Unfortunately, Mr. Hudak and Mr. McGinty uh, didn't support a bill that I put forward uh, to cap the CEO salaries in the public sector. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, big numbers. There's no way that we should have a priority being the CEO of a hospital, getting his six-figure raise every single year, while a woman like Marita DeVries in London loses the nurses that help her through her, her breast cancer uh, treatment. That is the wrong priority in health care. That's your record, Mr. McGinty. You know what? And it was the record when the NDP were in power, too, last time, because they didn't have any money either. They put patients first in a health care system. I'm going to include right now an interview I did at a health clinic during the Brandt election with the lady in charge. Here I am outside the uh, natural birthing clinic in Brantford where they're going to be talking about not enough money, no doubt. So I'm going to go find out how many of them would take tax credit bonds that they can uh, use like in Argentina. We're talking about the main issue for today is talking about pay equity for midwives. All right. So in that red folder that you've got there, there's some handbills and information. Okay. But midwives have been publicly funded for the last 17 years in Ontario. Sure. And 11 of those 17 years, we didn't get a raise. So compared to comparator healthcare providers, All right. we are significantly under Okay. Let me tell you what they did in Argentina. Okay. The unions who were underpaid and they were going to be laid off when they ran out of money. Yeah. They said, you're going to pay us with $10 provincial bonds, yep. which we can use to pay our taxes, our license fees, our hydro, our health care. An alternative currency. And so I'm saying, I call that the Argentine solution, right. where I'll take $10 provincial bonds from Ontario if I can put them in these places, because yep. I think everybody else will too. Right. So would you take a pay raise in provincial bonds, if nothing else? No. I think if... This is personal, I'm not speaking on behalf of all men. No, 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 I know that. But if we actually had a system whereby we had an alternative currency, yeah. like the Kingston Hours or the Ithaca Hours, right. which is actually functional, yeah. and you could use for real services, yeah. 
I think we could really revolutionize our economy. Well, that is not speaking for the Ontario Midwives, of Asso Midwives Association. That's my own. Personal. I appreciate you know about time banking. Yeah. Well, did you know that I usually have my let's sticker on here, yeah. and I'm going to put it on right now because I financed the very first let's time bank software in the world in 1984, oh, nice. and I got invited to the United Nations in 2000 to do the speech on banking, and they passed the Uni Let's Resolution for green money based on. Anyway, thanks for your comments, but. Here. But sure, if the province of but that's pretty good money, you know, bond money, right? Province of Ontario, you trust them with their hydro if and their you taxes. Would like a statement from the Ontario no, no, Department. I want it from you, my dear. I don't care, but I'll and ask it everybody. Would be my own self, yeah. personally, not not speaking for all midwives. If it was actually functional as a currency in our modern economy, yeah. absolutely. Good girl. What's your name? Kelly Gaskell. Thanks a lot. Hello, my dear. You run this clinic? I talk, yes. And what's actually, your name, please? I'm Kathy Penzak. Okay. Susan actually runs the clinic. She's All right. our office administrator. <laughs> Would you take a short minute to just tell me a little bit, right away from your point of view, what's important here? Uh, the, the main point we are trying to get across is that uh, we want midwives to be paid uh, at the level they should be paid at compared to other professionals. Um, and we're not. We're All right. Now, did you ever hear what the Argentines did when they ran out of money? In, t in 1980s, what they did was the unions said, you're not going to lay us off. You're going to pay us with small denomination provincial bonds. Now, if we printed $10 provincial bonds that you can use for hydro, for taxes, for health care, for fees, would you take an increase in provincial bonds, if nothing else? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, my dear. That's the idea. Okay. It's called the Argentina Bond Solution, and that's all I'm talking about. And I can apply it to all the poverty issues. Neat, eh? Anyway, thanks a lot, my dear. Now I'm going to live around your clinic. And now, how do you like that? That's not stupid. I just to, to back to uh, Mr. McGinty on this. I, I just don't believe, sir, that the man that brought us the e-health scandal, where a billion dollars went down the drain, one of the biggest scandals in the history of the province, and a premier who was on track to doubling our provincial debt, what took 35 premiers 142 years to do, you, sir, will do during your time in office. We yeah, but that happened to them when they were in office, and it happened to the NDP because debts double with interest. It depends on the interest, how fast it doubles. He's been in power eight years. Well, yeah, it's going to have doubled. Even at only 8%, it would have doubled. So, big deal. That's double. I just cannot afford that runaway spending. So let me address a bit more Majed's question. Well, yes, he's right. We can't afford it. I've been saying that for a long time. So we should stop paying interest by running the money ourselves. What's his idea to fix the fact we can't afford it? First, I'm going to reduce the size of my cabinet. Oh, yeah, okay. He's going to cut three paychecks. <laughs> I'm going to actually start leadership at the top. My cabinet will be at least 20% smaller and more focused on the priorities of family. All right, better service with less people. Standard Tory policy. Today. We'll also review every one of the 630 agencies, boards, and commissions in our province. Oh, going to spend a lot of time doing bureaucratic reviews. He's going to have to hire more bureaucrats. Sounds like, yes, minister. Believe it or not, 630. <laughs> my little girl, those of you that have a, a little one at home, my little girl Miller could take the fridge magnets of letters on, put any three letters on the fridge in any order she wants to, and she'll get some government agency that you've never heard of. But you're paying millions and millions of years to stay. We'll go through every one with a very simple test. If it works, keep it. If it's broken, then you fix it. But if it can no longer justify its value to the families who pay the bills, you have to close it down. Mr. Well, just 650 programs he wants to look over with a fine tooth comb. That'll fix things. And my friend Mr. Hudak references uh, government spending and the deficit. The deficit is significant and I would not, I would not deny that. <laughs> His shortages are significant. Yes. Well, we've done a few good things working together during the course of the past eight years. We've built 400 new schools. We've built 18 new hospitals. Six of those were in the north. Here's what we did with some of the money that we got in debt for. <laughs> We've invested in thousands of kilometers of new transmission lines. Thousands of megawatts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's, Here's how we spent the money. Here's, Here's how we spent the loans. 2,900 more doctors. Yeah, yeah, 10, yeah. yeah. more teachers and the like. So that's where the money has Still not enough, and Dalton. Then we by a terrible recession. And we did. We joined in concert with the federal government and governments around the world. We borrowed money and stimulated the economy. He borrowed money and stimulated the economy. Yes, sir. And now he's going to have to throttle the economy to pay back 
the borrowings plus the interest. We created thousands of jobs. We supported the auto sector. We referred to that as, as corporate welfare, but there were 400,000 jobs that they're hanging in the balance. We thought it was important to help those families. And we supported the training programs. Now we've got a great plan to lower our debt over time. We eliminated your deficit that you, you bequeathed to us back in 2003. Mr. Mr. Dollars so we to get it done. For all of the stats that you roll off your tongue, the people of Ontario feel like they've been ignored by you for the last number of years. Everywhere I go in Ontario, people... I see, yes. He's been ignoring people. <laughs> uh, they feel that uh, the government's taken them for granted and has not taken care of some of their basic concerns. The biggest one is the affordability of everyday life. So during that recession... The biggest one is not enough money. Affordability of everyday life. And she doesn't have any new source of money. And she's promising solutions. What you decided to do was hit families with a new unfair tax. I see. You splat took the dip over there to do the splash over here. That made life less and less affordable. You know what? I was in North Bay not too long ago. Oh, yeah, another uh, I anecdotal to story. A few drops for some of my friends. Uh, and as I, I approached the other side of the bar where the general public was, three women about my age were at the bar. We started chatting. And this woman said to me, she said, you know, Andrea? Well, she said, I took a I while. Loved, Mom. Average mom, I'm a working woman, I've got three kids, and I cannot make ends meet. My paycheck is staying the same, my bills are going up, and there's something wrong with the fact that I feel insecure at this point in my life. So she knows that there's something wrong, and she has relayed that someone else told her that something is wrong. And she's right, and that's your And she's right. Record, Mr. McGinty. Mr. Mr. Most people feel that way. You know, there's a very... Something's wrong, so vote for her. Clear choice uh, tonight. You have two parties that are high tax parts. Ms. Horvath's going to increase taxes on businesses. Ms. McGinty will increase on the taxes contrary, on Mr. Mudak, on the Ah, uh, he says she's going to dip over here to splash over there. And then she was accusing the other guy of dipping over there to splash over there. The dip and splash debate. Spending parties. You only have you one know party. My, you should know my we'll better than that. We'll actually control runway spending and focus on what's important, health and education. And if you want to get the books... He wants to dip over here and splash a lot over there. ...back in order. We surely can't stick with the government that increased spending by 80% when the economy only grew by 10%. We'll set priorities. We'll give families relief, like taking the HSD off. So he's going to cut spending. Pete and Hydro, so they can spend again. And I will focus... Oh, but he wants them to spend again. ...like a laser on private sector job creation. Good jobs to get us moving. One more comment for each of you, Tim. Great. Um, I want to uh, just reinforce the notion of the support we're providing for families. We got rid of that $5.6 billion deficit, and now we've been focused on providing relief for families. So we started by cutting electricity bills by 10%. We provided $355 by way of income tax. All right, so he can't provide you with jobs so you can help pull your weight, but here's a list of all the charitable contributions you've been getting for doing nothing cut to the average Ontario family. Moving forward, we want to reduce tuition by 30%. That's $1,600 a year. I'd rather give you a good paying job. For a family, in, uh, for a student in university, that's $6,400 less for a university degree. And finally, there's a $1,500 tax credit for seniors to help them make renovations to their home. So that's real, solid support to help. Real, solid splashes. And he hasn't yet dealt with the dips. And that was the original question, right? Where are you going to do the dips? And nobody wants to deal with it. Family deal with their costs in the homes where it's really important to them. Andrew Horvath. Uh, Mr. Hudak knows that I'm not raising taxes on families. In fact, he borrowed some of my uh, tax reduction uh, uh, issues off of my agenda, which is... Tax reduction issues. Is the HST off home heating, hydro, although I'm taking it off gas and I'm going to... Uh, cap gas prices in Ontario, but you know what? I'm going to follow in the footsteps of, of uh, NDP premiers around the country who actually have the best record, better than the Conservatives, better than the Liberals. Remember Ray Day's unpaid labor when you could have gotten provincial bonds? In terms of the way they've dealt with their budgets. We have been in the deficit position fewer times than each of these parties, and in fact... <laughs> You've been in power fewer times, but in deficit both times. When we have run deficits, they have been a lower deficit to GDP ratio. Ah, uh, so she's not as bad a loser as the other two losers. That's the footsteps that I'm going to follow in uh, when it comes to the way I operate this problem. So she's going to be less of a loser like the former less of a loser was.
and when I get the opportunity. That's the last word in this segment. We go on now to question three. Question three again on videotape. Let's watch if we could. My name is Norma Yurst from Frailton, Ontario. At the age of 69, my husband has returned to work part-time so that we can afford to remain in our home. Some of our neighbors have had to sell their homes. My question is this. What specific steps would you take to assist Ontarians like myself living on fixed incomes who are facing financial difficulties due to the rising costs and taxes on essential goods and services? Log on to PayPal Ontario. Cut checks in Ontario bucks for all your mortgages and interest-bearing debts to stabilize them into one interest-free debt. And after that, all your payments go against principal. I'd even be able to look into getting back past interest you paid on your debts and putting that back into your account. But that's a little more programming. Let's get the first thing fixed and stabilize your debts. So, a PayPal Ontario, where you can log on with Visa or with your hours of labor. Your husband's still working, still good for stuff. So are you, I'm sure, if you want. Stabilize your debt. After that, all payments go against principal. If there are any left, once you get your interest back. But let's hear what the candidates, leaders, who have no money, uh, do. Say. Empathy, no doubt. Okay, our one-on-one -on -one this time features Dalton McGinty and Andrea Horvath. And Mr. McGinty, you get the first word. Norma, thanks very much for a really important question that weighs heavily on the minds. I know a lot of Ontario... That's a lot, 30 seconds wasted every time, you know? Seniors. What we want everybody to do, myself included, when it comes to my own mom, is to have the wherewithal to be able to stay in that place which... Okay, so that's what he wants. ...is really important to her, which is her home. So, you've heard me reference this a few times already, but I think it's important to repeat it. We've got a brand new tax credit, $1,500. Do you think that's really going to help much? to help seniors renovate their homes in order to make them more friendly, accessible, and safe for them as they get on in years. We've also been rebuilding our electricity system. There are costs associated with that. There's no getting around that. We just gotta get it done. So in order to help all of our families deal with that, we're reducing the cost of electricity bills by 10%. Dip, dip, we also dip. have an energy and property tax credit specifically for seniors. It goes up to $1,100. Beyond that, we've increased, we've, we've decreased taxes by $355 for the average Ontario family. And my concern is that Mr. Hudak... All right, so dip, 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 dip. All little bribes. But is that as good as being able to stabilize all your debts and save all your interest? And then being able to pay off all your debts someday? You really think a $1,500 dip is going to help you deal with your mortgages? No, it won't. But working for provincial bonds that you can use to pay your debts. Stable debts, now that would. It's going to be increasing property taxes by $500 million. We made an agreement with the municipalities to take that off property taxes. He wants to put that back on. Back home in my hometown of Ottawa, that means a 6% property tax hike. All right, so Hudak wants to dip over here to splash over there. We can afford that. He's going to have to wait five minutes before he gets in to answer that. But meantime, Ms. Horvath, it's over to you. Well, Norma, you've uh, raised a, an issue that seniors all over Ontario have been uh, talking to me about because on a fixed income, as the unfair HST, for example, uh, was put on your bills, there is no way that you can make that up except for, as you say, uh, your husband taking a, another job. Uh, yes, things are bad. Uh, in his golden years, which is really unfair for seniors who have... Things are unfair. ...worked so hard to, to build our communities and contributed yes. so much already. Yeah. So we're going to take the HST off home heating. We're going to take it off... She'll dip over here and dip over there. Off hydro. We're going to start taking it off of gas. Dip over there. Uh, we're going to make sure that we, we cap gas prices. Dip uh, that. So that there's no unfair gouging at the pumps. Uh, but we're also going to provide uh, extra help for seniors around the home. We Dip have it over a there. Program Splash. We're going to provide seven and a half million hours of extra help around the home to help you do the kinds of chores that, that maybe aren't so easy. Seven and a half million hours? Now that sounds like my kind of talk. Where is she going to get the money? Anymore. Things like shoveling. I'm just going to give you a receipt for those hours that you can use as provincial bonds. Your walk, cutting your grass. I know my own mom uh, started to feel insecure about staying in her own home because she could no longer bend into the laundry machine yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. to do her laundry. Uh, so these are the kinds of supports that will help seniors to stay in their home. 
And these are the kind of supports that have been organized in Japan's free Ukipu system. But you can't stay there if it's not affordable. And she doesn't have enough money and they can't stay there. So we're also uploading the, uh, the, the download uh, of services, the, the bills that are being paid off the property tax that are really provincial bills. And we're going to get rid of those off municipalities, but we're going to do more than that. We are going to offer municipalities uh, to take 50% of the operating costs of their transit systems off of their shoulders, freeze transit fares, lots okay. of seniors are taking transit, this makes transit more affordable, uh, and also helps with the property tax rates as well. That's a lot of money needed to make all those promises come true. Specific, okay. specific to, the, to the question and, and to seniors. One of the things that seniors keep telling us again is they like to spend as much time as they possibly can and live out as much of their lives as they possibly can at home. Yes, we all want that too, right? We're going to bring back something that never should have been taken away, and that's health calls. So why didn't you bring it back eight years ago? We're going to have doctors and nurses come to your home to see you when you can't get out of the house. We're also going to invest in a major way in more home care. Yeah, nurses are coming there. to the home and providing care on a regular basis when you need that. That's not just great for seniors, but it's great for taxpayers. It's just so much less expensive to care for our moms and dads and our grandparents in their homes than it is to have them go to long-term care homes or into a hospital setting. Now that's a smart plan, it's a sensible plan, and it's a serious plan suited to the times. Well, and unfortunately, the just eight years has late. not been the implementation of that plan. And we have also made a commitment to, uh, to bump up the hours of home care because we see what's happening every year. I hear it in my constituent hours of home care. It's the office. People phone me up usually between January and the end of March and say, uh, we've run out of fund. The, the, the agency has run out of funding. It's called the CCAC. They've run out of funding. They're cutting back home care hours uh, every single week. So people who used to rely on home care all of a sudden can't even rely on it anymore. That's the record of the McGuinty Liberal government. People have to ask themselves in this election, do you want the status quo that hasn't been working for you? Or do you want the kind of change that puts C change that puts seniors ahead seniors first that puts patients first and that's the kind of change that you can trust new democrats will bring so not how to do the change but just bet that it's change no segment of the population has greater call upon our health care resources than our seniors and that's only natural we splash plenty over there so seniors really need to see improvement inside health care we, we we didn't even measure wait times before now not only are we measuring them, we've got the shortest wait times in the country. We've got doctors for 1.3 million more Ontarians. So we've come a long way. We've built, as I said before, 18 hospitals. Mr. Hudak, when he was in government with his party, they closed 20 hospitals. And they fired some 6,000 nurses. Now, how many people in Canada don't even have a doctor? Five million. And Canada's share right now is 1.6 million. And he just said that he's provided doctors to 1.5 million. So he's basically saying that he's covered half. So his vast program is really only half vast. So we've turned things around. The next thing we want to do in healthcare, in addition to what I've talked about already, is to ensure that when it comes to children, because I know seniors are very concerned about it. What he wants to do is ensure. The grandchildren too. We're going to ensure that we provide a healthy snacks program in our schools, because we're concerned about obesity levels. We've got a new Unless he runs out of money, then he'll go, oops, sorry. Program for 6 to 12 year olds after school to keep our kids active instead of at home. Pass the got to get an one. Yeah, yeah, splash, splash. Yeah, yeah, we know. Where are the yeah, dips? I just want to share with Mr. McGinty and Mr. Hudak a letter that I received from a, a, a man who was telling oh, another anecdote. me that his mom uh, was taking care of his father. At, Things are bad. At, uh, at the last stages of his life, he was palliative and they brought him home. And he was on a number of life-saving devices. Uh, when she opened her hydro bill, she cried. She, she had to pay more. She was in tears because she could not afford to pay the hydro bill that was uh, come through her mail because of the extra cost of HST on hydro that this government put on people's back when they could at least afford it. You know what is in, in store for you with a government that hits you with an unfair tax at a time when you're... All whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, I see. If you're down, then a tax is unfair, but if you're up, the tax is not unfair. Already uh, feeling the pinch from a recession. Okay, That's not up. the kind of Ontario we want. Mr. Mr. No. Well, thank you, and I want to thank uh, Norma Bray. So her whole bit was that his way we don't want. Much for the question. 
And Norma, I, I spoke with a, a woman in similar circumstances. Her name was Betty. Another. I met her in Richmond Hill. And Betty Soft said, story. You know, Tim, I paid off the mortgage on my home, but I can't pay the hydro bill. Soft story. I'm worried story. about making ends meet. And Tim, I might have to actually sell my home. That's wrong. <laughs> Competing sob stories. That's not the kind of Ontario we want to see. And that's, what we that's what she just said. Can't afford four more years of Dalton McKenzie will <laughs> increase your taxes and put your hydro bill through the roof. So here, Isn't that cute? They both said the same thing. Here's what we'll do in our change book plan. Oh. We'll take the HST off your heat. Spl we'll take it off your hydro Splash. bill. We'll take that debt retirement charge off your hydro bill as well. Splash. Because families have paid more than their fair share. And here's the Dip second. where? These time of use smart meters are really nothing more than oh. machines on a lot of things. The only thing that seems to be smart about them is no matter how much you change your behavior, they still hit with some kind of tax prep. We will unplug the mandatory time use smart meters and we'll give every family the choice. Because it doesn't work for seniors who are home during the day. What nickel dining? Every senior can get up late at night to do the laundry. Not every family can have all the kids showered and fed and ready for school before 7 a.m. when the heart rates kick in. Well, you know, Mr. Hudak has said this three times now, and he's probably said it several thousand times in the recent years. He keeps saying that I'm going to be raising taxes. I'm not raising taxes. That's right. He's going to provide all these services and all these benefits without any new money. And you shouldn't keep but saying that. But we've heard that. 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 We've heard but the fact of the matter is we live a solid foundation for prosperity and growth. The fact of the matter is we're reduced... Okay, we, no prosperity and growth, but there's a solid foundation laid. ...income taxes for families by $355. What a nickel dimer, eh? $355. The fact of the matter is we're reducing tip, uh, the electricity bills by 10%. And moving forward, we're going to do we're more of the respect to service. Oh. Everybody's screaming about electricity bills, and he's proud about reducing them by 10%. What's adding up here? Right, sir, we're going Nobody to reduce tuition. Believes you. We're going to reduce tuition more. by 30%. Beyond that, beyond that, again, we're going to provide a tax credit for seniors in their homes. Okay, splash here, splash there, splash there. But no new taxes. You're saying that you're going to take a little bit off the HST. You said you're against the HST. Ms. Horvath says she's against the HST. Well, why are you keeping the HST? I'll tell you why you're keeping it. Because it's essential for our competitiveness. When the, when the recession hit us, I ask businesses and economists what's the single most important thing that we can do to ensure that we grow, keep jobs, and create more jobs. And they said in unison, we have got to adopt a single value added tax. Okay. The, big answer is <laughs> the big answer is a single value added tax. Think about that. The people he consulted with. You, 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 said, you, 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 you said you lower taxes, you said that hydro bills are coming down. Sir, with all due respect, and nobody believes you anymore and for good reason you're saying tonight that you're not going to increase taxes but with all due respect we've heard you say that not once but twice and you broke your promises over and over again you brought in the hst you brought in the sneaky eco tax you brought in the health tax increase hydro bills have gone through the roof and now you apply the smart meter tax as well so why should anybody believe you when you've broken your word time and time again that's i gotta get Ms. Hort, I think. now do you notice that it's always the opponent is pointing out where they're going to be dipping, okay? He'll be dipping there, he'll be dipping there, he'll be dipping there, but they never say where they're going to be dipping so they can do all the splashing they're talking about. Or about equal time and then you can come back. Well, it's interesting that they talk about the HST because everybody knows that uh, Mr. McGinty teamed up with Mr. Harper to bring in the HST. And, and although Mr. Hudak made a lot of noise in the House, I, I think he was pretty quiet when he was uh, should have had, could have had a chance to talk to his, uh, his federal leader about making sure that the HST wasn't implemented in Ontario. And I think that we see the results of it. And it's kind of sad that Mr. McGinty actually admits today that instead of listening to the needs of everyday people, to the 80% or more of Ontarians who said we don't want the HST, I mean, he listened to his friends on Bay Street, the same friends that Mr. Hudak's leader listened to. I think it's time that we start paying attention to the people of this province, put their uh, pocketbook first, put their budget first, put their interests at the top of the agenda. Okay, so she wants to uh, reduce the dip over there so they can splash elsewhere. Now, I've always explained that there's nothing as stupid as a sales tax and an income tax where you have to keep a receipt for every hamburger you ever sold 
when we could have an asset tax once a year where you just count up how you did, what you got, and chip in your tithe as opposed to accounting for every single hamburger you ever made and all the expenses and the costs and the, it's turned us into a generation of clerks and a generation of jerks. So someday, I hope, no more keeping track that kind of receipts for the government watching every transaction. At the end of the year, you count up what you got, how you did, throw in your chip in, your share, and that's the way to do it. Asset tax, someday. So what your Democrats will do. I know that adopting the HST was not easy, but it was absolutely essential to growing a stronger Ontario economy. And since we've adopted the HST, we've created some nine. All right, so adding taxes uh, helps the economy. 8,000 new full time jobs in Ontario. <laughs> Tax collectors. According to Stats Canada. I want to return to the issue of the smart meter, something that Mr. Hudak has talked about regularly. The fact of the matter is we are moving as hard as we can in Ontario to put those smart meters on all our homes and all our businesses because they help us practice better conservation. They shift our patterns so we're using electricity after 7 in the evening and before 7 in the morning. And the fact of the matter is that's where most families have already gone. That's where we use most of our electricity after 7 in the evening and before 7 in the morning. And that's the discount period. And so it applies to 48 hours during the weekend as well. That means two-thirds of the week has a discount period for electricity. Why have we done this? Because it means we don't have to build as much new generation. And we don't have to. And when we don't have to build as much new generation, then it lowers our fees overall. That's why we're doing it. Mr. Huday? Listen, hey, these smart meters are no more than a tax grab. And I think you know that. Seniors what, are well, going to well, let, let, say, say, let me respond to the question. How much you know, let, let me respond to the question. question. You call a smart what? a tax grab. Here's the reality. There's a penny that's going to the government. <laughs> When people are getting dinged at high rates because they dare to live a normal life, it's a tax grab, sir. I don't think seniors should be punished for doing the chores during the day. And what's a shift worker supposed to do? Take a day off so they can do the chores at home? I don't think families should be hit just because they're trying to use energy during the day. I'll end the mandatory program that's a tax grab. And let me ask you this, too. Families simply cannot afford another Dalton McGinty tax grab. You've done it over and over again. And you say it wasn't easy, sir. The easy choice is to increase taxes. You keep doing that because you can't set priorities. The challenge for leadership is setting priorities. Ours are health and education and relief for families. Sir, you just need to attack the last word. Okay, we'll give her a word. We believe that people want to do the right thing and, and want to uh, conserve energy. They want to reduce their uh, carbon footprint. They want to do the right thing by the environment. But the smart meter program didn't help them do that. People weren't able to conserve in large numbers, and they weren't able to uh, reduce their bills. So, I wonder why not? What New Democrats are going to do is we're going to take almost a billion dollars of money that's sitting uh, in a planning for a new nuclear build, and we're going to shift that to give people the tools to make green choices, retrofit their homes, a program which you canceled, Mr. McGinty. Uh, uh, make sure that there's... I know, but what are you going to do with the rest of the nuclear problem? loans and grants available for those households that are that are not able to uh, to make those investments because we know lots of people are having a challenge with their finances. Okay, so she's going to splash a lot of money over there. Uh, rebate programs to get rid of those old appliances. Splash. If we give people the tools to go green, they will. We don't believe in the stick of... She calls giving them the money to afford to go green, giving them the tools. ...approach that you do. We believe in the carrot approach. Last word that's, the, that's the change that New Democrats are I can't figure out from one day to the next where Ms. Horvath stands when it comes to clean electricity and why, why she doesn't put forward a plan that might be supported by Dr. Suzuki instead of our plan being supported by Dr. Suzuki. Like her. We're shutting down coal. All right. Now, Dr. Suzuki is someone who continues to remain fooled by the guys who used Mike Mann's trick to hide the decline in global temperature as Al Gore was hyping that car our carbon, human-based emissions, were causing global warming. And we find out now it's all a lie that the temperature was going down with the carbon dioxide going up and that they used the trick to fudge the graph to make the hockey stick to make it go up. So, we caught them admitting they used the trick to hide the decline. So, well, how much of a decline? Well, the point is, 
People like Suzuki are still pushing the line that we are the ones who are causing a problem that's going to cause runaway global warming, while the decline in global temperature says that's not true and that there's no reason we shouldn't be burning coal because the carbon dioxide is going to make for more trees. The sole part, we reduce its usage by 9%. Imagine, he doesn't want to use any coal. What's he going to be end up with? Nuclear! What an idiot! They told us that when we were burning coal to the max, that was the equivalent of $3 billion in annual costs to our health care system. Beyond that, we're creating an exciting new clean energy sector. Well, there's nothing wrong with new clean energy, but uh, I don't know where he gets this story about the health sector. Again, I think we should be at the front of the curve on this, not at the back. We know the world is going towards clean energy. I want us to be the best in North America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Cheerleader. We, us too, yeah. Be, be, be the best. We're going to bring in a carbon tax. Mr. Suzuki's is a big champion. Your caucus are big champions. Families cannot afford your carbon tax. That's $500 for a typical you say that. All right, so his excuse isn't that global warming is a lie and that it's a complete waste of money. His excuse is we can't afford it. You've got to give him another word. Go ahead. You've got to, and we want to come back on that. So, you know, uh, you just, just read my plan. Just read my plan. I've been asked, just read your plan. I've been asked plan. And just read my plan. Just read the plan. He's got a plan. When it comes to taxation, there's only two people here who are absolutely committed to increasing taxes. Property taxes, $500 million. And Dip. Dip. See, she's dipping, he's dipping. Okay, that's the end of this segment here. We're halfway there. Here comes question four. Roll tape, please. Good evening. My name is Mike, and I'm from Toronto. This is a question for all the leaders. We live in difficult times, times that require leadership that is unafraid to talk about bold ideas, tell important truths, and ask something of the people of Ontario. I think it's fair to say that this has not happened in this campaign. So my question is this, why not? Why not talk about some bold ideas, tell some important truths, and mostly, why not ask the people of Ontario for the kind of shared sacrifice that will be necessary to take us through this difficult time? Well, that's because they have no bold ideas. Jeez, sir, what do you want? Okay, Dalton McGinty and Tim Budak start this one-on-one -on -one debate. Mr. McGinty, you have the first word. Mike, I... A debate about their bold ideas, and they're going to talk about, oh, we'll splash a little over here and splash a little over there. How bold. <laughs> Appreciate the question. Yeah, I'm always nice with... been, uh, accused of not asking people to do some hard things from time to time. And we have done a couple of hard things in particular, and they're so important for us to keep doing. We're rebuilding our electricity system. There are some big yeah. costs associated with that. Yeah. Give, give you one We're splashing over there. Tunnel underneath Niagara Falls. It's we'll splash over there. As long it's going to deliver clean electricity for 100 years. Well, it costs one and a half billion dollars, and it just happens to fall to our generation to get that done. We also adopted the HST. Not an easy thing to do, but the fact of the matter is, it's helping us catch up to 140 other countries around the world that have that kind of a tax. So our businesses, when they compete in a very <laughs> It's good for us because other countries have all got it. The colleagues <laughs> are doing so with one hand tied behind their back. Again, my colleagues here say they're against the HST, but they're going to keep the HST. They're and of course, I think that's a stupid way of doing things, because you know what I think about that. But even then, even if we did keep the HST, and he says that's enough to fund all these great things, as long as we can pay it with provincial bonds, and we're paying people plenty of bonds to get out there and do work for us, then there's no problem, is there, with an HST tax, because we have the money to pay it with. Of course, we could not have done this without Mr. Mr. Hudak's support, based in Ottawa through the federal conservative government. Now, those are hard things. We've done them. We're doing them. <laughs> He's got an agreement with the Tories to raise taxes. <laughs> That's hard. So they can both get some. That's really important. That Tells me they're all connected together. That's all. Keep moving forward because the global economy is looking for a place that is safe, secure, and stable. Mr. That's what we have here in Ontario. To lure investment for jobs. Here's where Mr. McGinty and I strongly disagree. It's not a hard thing to increase taxes. It's the easy route, and one that Dalton McGinty has taken time and time again. And why is it that your big Raising taxes is easier than cutting services? 
ideas always end up costing average families. Your big idea for the HST was a big tax grab. You put 8% more on the basics uh, like heat and hydro. He's dipping Your over big here. Idea for the smart meters has made it very difficult for seniors, for shift workers, for small businesses. Uh, Mr. McGinty always says that we need to tighten our belts, but he never tightens his own. The government spending has gone up by 80%. He's trying to run a government that tries to be all things to all people. So what does leadership mean in Ontario today? He's splashing, splashing, splashing over here too much, splashing over there too much. Creation. So we're the best place in all of Canada to find a good job. And I'm darn proud to say that I'm the son of immigrants who came to Ontario barely speaking a word of language. Only a few dollars in their pockets, but they believe in this province. It was a place of hope and opportunity. And as a father of a little girl today, oh. I'm going to go off that track. All the way to the best place again in Canada. Cheerleading! Doing a good job, a ticket from raw, the raw, raw. family. Raw, raw, raw. <laughs> he wants to be best. He says it's unbecoming to run down our province. He says we're the best in Canada in terms of our economy, our health care, Him too. And education. Who's the better cheerleader? Now the we're the best. Bold ideas. Well, you can't get much bolder than saying we're going to be the first in North America when it comes to producing clean energy technologies. I mean, think about what we want to leave to our children. Do we really want them to say 20 or 30 years from now, why can't anybody do anything about those international oil and gas prices? We can't. Every time we buy oil and gas here in Ontario, we're creating jobs elsewhere. Every time that we deal with paychecks elsewhere, clean energy technologies here, and buy clean, uh, energy from renewables, from wind and the sun, we're creating jobs here in Ontario for our kids. We know the world is pretty good splashes in sand. There first, at some point in time, American moms and dads are saying. We've got to stop burning coal. We've got to start buying clean electricity. We're going to have the technology and the manufacturing capacity. Actually, we can do both. In place, that's my vision. I think it's a bold one. I think it's within our... <laughs> Half a vision. Half-assed. ...to grasp, but I want us to keep moving towards that, Mr. Gouda. And the problem is it's a borrowed vision that has failed elsewhere. When other jurisdictions tried the Green Energy Act of increasing hydro bills for everybody and then handing out subsidies to a few, they found that for every job created, a subsidized job, it cost a, a million dollars. They sure are pretty good at dissing the other guy, though, weren't they? Uh, in subsidies to create that job. Then the jobs disappeared when the subsidies dried up. And for every so-called subsidized job you create, you lose three or five jobs in the broader economy. Now, let me ask you this, Mr. McKinsey. You said to Ms. Horvath, you criticized her plan to increase business taxes. I agree. I think that will kill jobs. But if you... Kill jobs. I think it's such a bad thing. Why did you do it? Well, why in your first term did you increase business taxes just as much as Ms. Horvath wants to do today if you think it's wrong? Well, we're, the fact is we're reducing business no, taxes. No, no, you increase business we're taking taxes. It, we're taking Sir, it you increase business taxes. We're taking it one step further, in fact. Let's talk about small business because they are the, the champions when it comes to creating jobs here in Ontario. We start off with a small business tax of 5.5%. We've got it down to 4.5%. And now our plan is to take it down to 4%. The fact of the matter is, there is tremendous instability in the global economy. And after California, we're the second most preferred destination in all of North America to receive foreign investment. Lawn sharks love us second best. I'm not sure how, after Mr. Hudak cancelled the Samsung contract, he can go to Asia, for example, as previous and say, I want to do business with you people. How can he look them in the eye after he cancelled a 7 billion dollar contract, creating four new manufacturing plants and 16,000 jobs at the forefront of an exciting new clean energy industry. Quick response, yeah, yeah, let me just very quick respond. respond to that. I mean, you know this is a billion dollar sweetheart giveaway that will drive up hydro bills to go to one of the biggest multinational corporations in the world. But I want to say this, you sidestep my question, you try to slip away, you didn't answer what I asked you. If you think it's bad that Ms. Horvath increases business taxes in her plan, why, sir, did you do so? In fact, you increased them to 14 percent, costing us jobs. I want to get back to what Mike asked. I'd, I'd That's like what to know why the Premier thinks it's bad for you, but it's well, okay for him. I okay, think it's time. time to get back to what, what Mike asked, and that is about, about leadership and how do you, you make the big decisions that take the bold actions. And I have to say that sometimes... Okay, this is not about bold actions, but the leadership to take bold actions, if she can ever think of one. It's about acknowledging when you've done something wrong and changing gears uh, to do something different. That's bold, changing directions when you're losing. 
this is the situation that both of uh, both of these uh, gentlemen continue to uh, to desire the reduction of, uh, of corporate taxes. The idea that blank checks to companies that just ship jobs somewhere else is the right track. I disagree. So I think a bold thing to do is to say it hasn't worked for the last 10 years. We've given away 20 billion dollars and not had the jobs uh, to come with that. So we're going to do things differently. I think it's also acknowledging that municipalities like Toronto and others, I think Mike said he was from Toronto, uh, are struggling with the ability to pay for their transit systems and yet we know uh, that getting more people onto transit is a good thing. So one of the uh, bold ideas maybe, in fact it's, it's something that used to be done in the past, is we're going to take 50% of the operating costs off of the backs of municipalities and freeze transit rates. That all right, now that's a pretty big promise, eh? That's a pretty big splash there. She's going to be, uh, someone's going to be taking a dip, right? The way municipalities can increase their transit systems, they can put more trains and buses and increase their routes, and people don't have to carry the burden on increased fares. Mr. Those Mayor. are a couple of ideas, I think, that are change. Change for the better. Change that puts people first. All right, to speak directly to Mike again, a couple of other bold ideas. We worked long and hard to secure Toyota's new auto assembly plant here in Ontario. Oh. Brought it here in about 2006. Oh. He we got, got a loan, jobs there. some investment. Recently they announced they're going to build their first electric car here. Well, I'm very happy if we had our own money, we could have did it ourselves. Uh, Two-way, all-day goal service in the GTA and all the way to Hamilton. That's going to be great for Thunder Bay, for example, because that's what we're going to make. We're going to make those you have new, a those new policy 500, that's going to make sure those that all new those trains cars, are built in the All those cars are already being made by Bombardier. So that's great news for the folks up in up in uh, Thunder Bay. Right. But it's also Sounds like a good splash. The productivity and efficiency of our economy. They tell me it's going to be like taking 71 million car trips annually off Ontario roads. That's a big, bold idea. It's a multi-year plan. It's a multi-billion dollar investment. It's bold and it's essential that we keep moving on And it's also something that's plan. in our platform. Mr. We're committed to the same. Yeah, so you know, they're, they're committed to the same splashes. Won't we'll answer my question about why he criticizes Ms. Horvath for business tax increases when he increased the exact same tax at the time Reducing. of the recession. But let, let me tell you this, I mean, every time uh, that you talk about any kind of jobs, there's always some big check attached. That basically meant that you taxed every other business, you taxed families, you had to bribe businesses to come to Ontario. I see a very different approach. I want... Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so he dipped over there and he dipped over there and he dipped over there, but he's got a different approach. All businesses to have the chance to succeed to hire jobs, to hire people again in our province. They have he wants them to be able to hire people even if they have no money. The million, 500,000 unemployed women in there. And that's why we have a five-point jobs plan, to create more skilled trades positions. Wow, so his five-point jobs plan will do it. To clear aside this maze of red tape yes. that frustrates all kinds of business leaders. That's a problem, red tape. Clean energy policy is economic policy not a social program, or the only part that will lower taxes to encourage spending in our economy again, this oh, yeah. So another one who promises to lower taxes and uh, provide more money for all these jobs. But Mr. Gudak, it was your failed experiment in the electricity system that we're dealing with uh, right now. The mess in the electricity system is because of the deregulation and privatization. Uh, I think you were maybe around the cabinet table when that took place in Ontario. Uh, and I have to say I'm quite disappointed that Mr. McGinty has followed on the same route. Uh, the, the big expense that we have in bringing renewables into our grid is that they're all very expensive private power deals. How ironic is it that we actually have a, a company that's owned by the public in Korea uh, running our re renewable energy system? That should be Ontario-owned uh, energy. That should be renewables that's in the public interest, uh, not uh, with private sector deals. Well, she knows what it should be, but not how to do it. And of course, if you do go back to the provincial bonds that you can use to pay your hydro bill with, who in Ontario doesn't have a hydro bill? Almost nobody. Wow, what a great currency. Deals that are costing us a fortune. Mr. McGinnis. So she didn't have any answer, okay? Things are bad, shouldn't be bad. Facts are always helpful. This is what we're doing here in Ontario with our green energy plan. All right, here's a splashing. 2,000 large and medium-sized energy projects being sponsored by Ontario investors. We've got 30,000 what we call Spending some over there. projects being sponsored by Ontario investors. These are families, these are farmers, who have decided to participate in this exciting new clean energy revolution in Ontario. 
They want to help subsidize a little bit of the work that's taking place on the farm or help support some, some modest family income. And it's this very buzz of activity that is attracting big companies like Samsung who want to come here. They're bringing, notwithstanding what Mr. Hudak is saying, they're bringing $7 billion into Ontario, creating 40 manufacturing plants in Ontario, creating 16,000 jobs over six years in Ontario. That's what it's all about, Mr. Hudak. And Canadians owning none of it and all profits going overseas when they could have financed that with our own provincial bond currency and kept those profits. Well, you, you know, there's just a fundamental uh, disagreement. Ms. Horvath and Mr. McGinty believe in handing out these expensive contracts for wind and solar power up to... All right, they believe in splashing over there. 80 cents uh, per kilowatt when the price of power is 5 cents in the marketplace. But any kid who runs a lemonade stand knows you can't... Hey, it's a kilowatt hour! And pay 80 cents for the lemons and then charge a nickel for the lemonade. Somebody has to pay that difference. And the problem is, it's seniors who are seeing their hydro bills increase, it's small businesses who are seeing hydro go through the roof and families. Gee, I guess hydro's going through the roof for everybody, and he can name them all off. We cannot continue on this path. Yes, agreed. What do you do differently? That's why I'll end that expensive energy experiment. Wow, he's going to end it. And make sure that when energy is added, it's a... And make sure of something. ...competitive, transparent basis, no sweetheart giveaways that are driving up your hydropower. Oh, okay, he's going to make sure. The most expensive energy experiment is the one that uh, your government brought in in the 90s. Uh, but the reality is we still have over 2,000 uh, private sector deals that are being managed by five hydro bureaucracies uh, that is costing us uh, a fortune. Uh, I am very committed to making sure we continue along the path of renewable energy. But I think it needs to be done in the public interest. We're going to take those five bureaucracies, we're going to take those over 11,000 uh, six-figure salaries, and we're going to pair that back down, and we're going to put an electricity system back together. Oh, yeah. It's a yeah, yeah, yeah. She's going to redo administration. Yeah, yeah. Cost-cutting. My... In the public interest. That will get our rates down, and that will make Ontario competitive again. That's the big cost, you know. Uh, overpaid employees. A couple points, if I might. Number one, I'm not saying that the hydro companies are perfect, but in fact, they've got one of the best histories in the world at ensuring that over the progress of time, during the course of our history, we always had a reliable supply of electricity, and I'm very, very proud of that. Beyond that, I want to, I want to say once again, there's a lot of instability in the global economy. After California, we're the second most favorite place in North America. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've, we've heard this before, haven't we? Foreign investment. So you can't go <sighs> around, as Mr. Hudak is proposing, and cancel these big international contracts. That's going to stand, send a shockwave to the international investment community. We've got, we got to make sure that Don't we can continue to track the contract that 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 so that we can, we can expand our economy, we can enjoy more prosperity, and create more jobs. You want to try that again? I'll try that All again. that discussion about splashing in the pool. Well, sir, you just cancelled an energy contract in this is One that you said was you were champion for six years, and then 11 days before election day, uh, you said, well, all of a sudden, you're against it. I mean, this, is, this looks like a government that actually is, we, we right. set of ideas, we and said it is on the run. So how much exactly, let me ask you, how much money are you going to throw into that pit in Mississauga for your last-minute flip-flop? We said that we would relocate. So where's the I said that I said that a moment ago. So where will it go? We have 2,000 big and medium-sized projects and some 30,000 small projects. So you put these in place and you try to anticipate to the best of your best of your ability where you're going to need new electricity and when you're going to need it. In Mississauga, this is a specific case where during the course of the past six years, things have changed. So we listen to the community. Right beside the location, there are now three condominium uh, <laughs> towers. And we have a new rule in place that says we couldn't even locate one single emissions-free wind turbine in that site. So it doesn't make sense to me. If we couldn't even put up one wind turbine, we could put up a gas plant. The so we're just going to take your just I think that's the important thing. Andrew just said, so what exactly has this part changed in the community? And now we're going to relocate it to a place that makes sense. So, so <laughs> suddenly something changed 11 days ago. I think it was more about that. A great line. The only thing that's changed, sir, is there's an election campaign, and you abandoned the policy that you championed for six years. We'll ask again, where are you going to move it to? How much is it going to cost Ontario families? And what has the election campaign changed well, last week? Mr. Hughes, I see it as a, as a failing to listen to people. I don't. 
about it. Leadership in part consists of listening and learning. We've made an adjustment. A lot has happened in the past six years. Three condominium towers have, have grown up around the site. Yes, I'm listening to the executive time to move on. Question five on videotape, and then uh, Tim Budek gets the first answer, debating this one-on-one -on -one with Andrea Horvath. Roll. My name is Mohamed Zaman, and I live in Ottawa. Post-secondary education is one of the most important milestones in a person's life. This year, close to 90,000 undergraduate students are heading towards this path despite the enormous financial commitment required. Okay, another not enough money story. Sob story for students. Many students find it difficult to pay for the cost of their education, never mind their cost of living. My question to the leaders tonight is, what will your party do to help post-secondary students throughout this critical but expensive academic endeavor? All right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let them log on to PayPal Ontario, open an account, and then cut checks for their complete education. And when it's over, like a student loan, like I had, in my generation, six months after I graduated, the interest started. Now, I managed to pay it off, but lots didn't. The point is, there won't be any interest starting if we're running a PayPal Ontario of our own. And you can be out there earning provincial bonds in all sorts of jobs, good jobs. So that's my answer for students. Student loans, as much as you need, and you pay it back working for us as fast as you can. Fair enough, and the debt doesn't grow. So all payments go against principal, and someday you're eventually out of debt. Tim, go back here first. Well, thank you uh, for the question. Thank you. Yeah. You know, there's no doubt that post-secondary education is a great equalizer in our society. It helped my dad, who is a son of immigrants, Yes, education is good. Uh, escape a, a low-income family. We became a high school principal in the Catholic system. My mom came from a very modest background as well and became a teacher. And therefore, I came from the middle class. We need to make sure that every student who has the grades... Yeah, yeah, we need to make sure. Nice goal. Now tell us how to pay for it. ...to qualify can get post-secondary education. Because you know, a university degree, a college diploma, a trade... Yeah, yeah, things are good. ...to yeah. a good job yeah, in the yeah. middle class. Well, actually, no. A paycheck will get you a good job, but just getting a university degree doesn't do the paycheck any good. And the second thing I'll say, Mohammed, we need to make sure there are good jobs out there. We ah, we need to make sure there are paychecks out there. Oh, he didn't know about paychecks. Graduate. i been hearing from young people all across the province. The jobs just aren't there. Wow. He knows the jobs just aren't there. The paychecks just aren't there and he doesn't know what to do about it. Henry Gorbett. And that's his statement. Things are bad, jobs aren't there. He didn't have an answer. Well, Mohammed, I'm really uh, happy that this question has come up. I was just in Ottawa not too long ago and uh, had a very uh, strange thing happen to me. I was about to get into my OPP vehicle and uh, and this young woman uh, approached me on the street. Quite a, I was quite surprised and she gave me a big hug and she said, thank you. And I said, well, well, what for? And she said, well, I'm a part-time student. And she said, in your plan to, uh, to freeze tuition fees and to take the uh, interest, the Ontario interest off the uh, OSAP loan uh, is going to make a big difference for me. Uh, it's, as a part-time student... For how long is the interest going to be off the loan? Freezing those tuition fees is going to make a, a difference in terms of how much I'm going to be paying to get my education because I... Now, under my system, we wouldn't freeze the tuition fees because the teachers should be paid what they're worth. So you'll just have enough money to pay them what they're worth. I can't afford to go full time. I have to work and go part time, so that freeze is going to make a big difference. And wouldn't an interest free loan to completely pay her education while she's in school solve that problem? Work when she can part time, but it's not forced. Taking the interest off is going to mean that I'm not going to be paying as much over time. Uh, New Democrats have been listening to students. Right now, we have the highest undergraduate student debt in all of Canada. We have... Yes, things are bad. The second highest... Uh, as, um, Give us stats. ...for graduate students. Uh, this is not a province that puts students first. In fact, we actually have the least 
per capita investment in post-secondary education. That's not the way uh, that students are going to uh, earn their degrees in, in a way that doesn't leave them with uh, debts the size of mortgages when they graduate. We are so she knows what's not the way. We're very committed uh, to making sure that post-secondary education uh, is achievable. Uh, for okay, so she's committed to making it achievable even though she couldn't explain at any point how she would do that more people I and that it's not that. a financial barrier here's another thing uh, Muhammad we're going to sorry I'm an engineer you know so I like to say I can do something for you and while these people are always saying what they'd like to do for you do to help out uh, young people trying to get into post-secondary education you know so many middle-class families are being squeezed out altogether yeah. under the current yeah. system of Mr. McGinty things are bad 60 to 70 thousand dollars in income they, they say you're too rich and your parents are too well off and you don't get any assistance. I, I think that's wrong. In fact, I'm going to increase assistance through OSAP. To help He'll splash a little bit over there. Middle class families. Now, it's not no taxes. A grant. It's a loan. You have to pay it back. But it opens up access. It's oh, 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 oh. That sounded pretty good. A loan. You have to pay it back. But how much? And let me tell you how I'm going to pay for it as well. You don't need to pay for it, boy. In a time that students are facing big debts in a tough job market, Dal McGinty chose to create a $30 million oh. foreign scholarship program. $40,000 scholarships only for foreign students. So, Mohammed, if you applied for that and you had an Ontario driver's license, you would well, he didn't like he didn't like that splash. Only for foreign students. So, Mohammed, if you applied for that and you had an Ontario driver's license, you'd be disqualified. I think that's wrong. I'll All right. So that's wrong, but he still hasn't told us what's right. Put Ontario's best and brightest first. I'll cancel that program and put it towards OSAP. Oh, project. he'll take it from them to give it to you. But, but the, That's what a guy who has no money does, right? The, the problem is, Mr. Dip and Mr. Splash. Dip, that uh, encouraging people to take more and more and more debt load on doesn't address Mohammed's issue. Don't forget, there's nothing wrong with debt load. It's only the interest on the debt load. So. I wouldn't mind taking on debt load for an education as long as every payment after that goes against principle. I don't mind paying for what I got. I just don't want to pay for any interest, something I got nothing for. Which is, tuition fees are already too expensive. Freezing tuition fees... They're not. Doctors of engineering deserve their paychecks. Faculty deserve it. Workers deserve it. Come on now. Just because you've got to pay the loan sharks their interest first and you ain't got enough to pay these people properly? They're not to blame. These will stop that climb. Uh, and instead of a rebate program with, which Mr. Uh, McGinty favors, we're going to freeze fees. That means everybody is able to, uh, to uh, gain from having lower tuition fees over time. Uh, I think that students need a break. I know that they need some hope for the future. And uh, older people needed a break and younger people needed a break and... Geez, everybody seems to need a break. And she's concerned about them all. And I know that there are lots of people in my own riding who are actually choosing not to go to post-secondary because the debt load is daunting. And so our plan is one that responds very much to what students like you, Mohammed, have said. Not very much, a little bit. A little bit, the no interest, you know, slowing down the fees means you've got to cover it somewhere else. Nothing as good as giving jobs to students, high-paying provincial bond jobs, that they didn't have plenty of money with which to pay their salaries of their teachers very well. Which is that something needs to be done uh, to, to reduce the amount of debt that students are facing to help... She's going to help reduce the amount of debt that's growing all the time. Don't forget, this mountain of debt is going to double every few years. That's how usury works. It doubles and doubles and doubles in time. So while the mountain of debt is growing, they're going to try and let you shovel out a little bit. You hit 300 here, 300 there. You've got to stop the growth of the debt first. And that means you need a PayPal Ontario account where you can settle your interest-bearing debts so that after that all payments go against principal. This is not going to help. 
give them a bit of a break. Uh, a bit of a break. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we'll call her Miss Bit of a Break. To make sure that jobs are there for them when they graduate. And that's the other part of our plan. We're going to reward the companies that create jobs for everyone, for new Canadians, for students, uh, for people who have lost their jobs. And of course, isn't that what all the other previous governments were trying to do too, by subsidizing these different sectors to try and create jobs? So she's saying she wants to do the same thing better. And you really think that doing the same thing that never worked before better is going to really work much better now? You've got to think outside the box. In the economy, these are the kinds of priorities that will help students not only with their debt loads, loads, but to get jobs as well when they graduate. That's the end of the one-on-one -on -one here. We can now open it up to all three. Mr. McGinty, you want to come in? Uh, Ms. Horvath, just so we're clear, is, is offering a freeze. Uh, our plan calls for a 30% reduction for families with, with incomes of $160,000 or less. All right, so he's got a bigger bribe. Getting that $1,600 off university tuition, $730 off college. Mr. Hudak is suddenly interested in education. Now, it may be that at some point in time along the way, and I've been in many question periods with Mr. Hudak, that he asked me a question about education, but I can't recall a single one. We've got a great record here in Ontario when it comes to post-secondary education. We've created 200,000 more spaces. Our plan now calls for 60,000 more. We're going to build three new, exciting, innovative undergraduate university campuses. And without raising taxes. If you compare Ontario to the rest of Canada, the enrollment in Ontario universities and colleges has gone up since 2003 by 26%. That's twice the pace that's gone up in the rest of the country. So families are making heroic measures, taking heroic, uh, making heroic efforts in order to get young people into college university. That's why we're going to help them with our 30% tuition reduction. Mr. Uh, you know, Dalton, you know that's not true. I've asked you many you questions you about education. One in particular was why at a time that uh, the students are facing significant debt, they're having trouble finding a good job in Ontario today, that you would choose to spend $30 million on a foreign scholarship program. Oh, what a peanut complaint. Jeez. Oh, foreigners are getting the money. We should. All the young men and women here in the province of Ontario, they need not apply simply because they're Ontario residents. I disagree. I'll oh. put that money into OSAP assistance for families instead. So he'll dip over here to splash over there. There's another difference between myself and my two points. Except the dip are people who can't vote. We're going to focus on modernizing our trades in the province. We're going to create 200,000 more skilled oh. trades positions. If you want to be an electrician, where do these numbers come from, you know? Wishful thinking. A carpenter, a welder, oh. plumber. Right now, you're heading down the road to Saskatchewan, to Alberta, because Dalton McGinty is clinging uh, to an old 1970s-based apprenticeship system. We'll help the colleges identify young apprentices, put them in jobs, and create 200,000 more skilled trade positions. So he'll put them in jobs. And he's got no new taxes and no money for paychecks, but he's going to put these people in jobs. So Mr. Kudak simply favors uh, giving more loans out and increasing student debt. Uh, Mr. McGinty uh, says that... Uh, well, there's nothing wrong with that if it's interest-free. He's going to allow tuition, free, uh, tuition fees to continue to climb. <laughs> no, I thought McGinty said he was going to cut them 30%, not continue to climb. Uh, and so that after a couple... Did she hear him wrong? There years, that 30% is going to be wiped out anyways. Oh, 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 I see. It'll continue to climb after the 30% is wiped out. Okay. Democrats think both of these are the wrong ways to go. We need to make sure... Well, she knows the two wrong ways to go. ...that students in Ontario are able to afford... A All right, she's got to make sure they're able to afford. <laughs> How can she do that without giving them a job? Think about that. ...post-secondary education, and you can only do that over time by freezing tuition fees? No. If you haven't enough money, most people can't go. You need to be able to earn the money to go if you want to. And making sure that opportunities are there for all students. Oh, yeah. She makes sure opportunities for all. Just She's going to make sure. No money, but she'll make sure. Uh, that's our commitment. That's the kind of thing uh, that changes the way oh. that these two people are talking and puts students first. And that's what's funny, you know, because when they get in, then all of a sudden these commitments disappear when they run up against no money. Uh, in Ontario. Mr. Begin, uh, I just want to come back to something that Mr. Hubeck referenced. 
Uh, he says that he doesn't believe that we should provide any scholarship support to foreign students. Ah. The fact of the matter is that foreign students who are coming to Ontario today are spending a billion dollars annually to help subsidize university and college education for all Ontarians. He says he doesn't like well, Samsung pretty good, because yeah. it's a foreign multinational. He's, uh, during the course of the campaign, he said that he called Canadian citizens foreigners. Oh, hold on I a second here. No, don't. You know that's not true. You know that's not true. You know that's not true. I think it's really important for us in here in Ontario to embrace globalization and to understand who we are. We're together. We're in this. We're tight. Cheerleader. We're success over the course of our history by moving forward together. So I just don't. I'm raw, not, raw, I'm raw. Not, I'm not comfortable. Well, hold, on a hold on a second. Hold on a second here. Foreign the reality okay. was. Okay. Foreign multinationals was and foreigners. Point made. Let's go. Okay. Here's the reality. And, and I know you want to say anything to not talk about your record in, in last jobs. Uh, your record at raising taxes. No, 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 no. Go to the foreigners. The I never said that. The reality is you brought in an affirmative action subsidy of ten thousand dollars initially your campaign chairman the president of the liberal party your finance minister said that was to attract foreign workers then you backtrack you said well it's for people who have lived in ontario for five years or less here's where i stand we're talking about Canadian Canadian value that it doesn't matter how long you lived in ontario whether it's six months six years 20 years or for your entire life we should all be treated equally an equal chance at a job based on how hard you want to work your skills and your experience but not foreign students. Not a ten thousand dollar affirmative action check for select few. Give everybody a chance to compete. And the premier's job, with all due respect to Mr. McGinty, is to create jobs for everyone to move our economy forward. So we all have a good shot. <laughs> so he thinks the premier's job is to create jobs, and uh, without knowing about how to focus on paychecks, what are the chances of that? At a good job, not a special ten thousand dollar handout. Ms. Orbe. And, and I think when the tenor of the discussion uh, sinks to this level, we lose sight of what Mohammed was talking about. Uh, and, and that's, I think, the most unfortunate thing that I've seen in this campaign so far is the, the hurling of accusations and insults when we should be focusing on how we make Ontario a better place, where people come first, where students come first, where jobs come first. Ah, oh, rhetoric, rhetoric. And I'm saying to Mohammed and to all of the other students who I've talked to over... She'll put jobs first, whatever that means. ...the years who have said to me, we have to get a handle on tuition fees. Ontario should not be 10th out of 10 uh, when it comes to per capita investment. We shouldn't have the highest undergraduate uh, debt load. We should... She sure knows what we shouldn't have. ...and have the highest... Uh, gra the second highest graduate uh, cost. That is the wrong way for the province to go. So if you uh, an expert on the wrong way. You want the kind of change uh, that puts us on a, in a different direction. Vote for me if you want to change. Choose new Democrats because we believe students should come first. Mr. Begate. Uh, well, just to again uh, relate a few facts. When it comes to post-second education in Ontario, as I mentioned a moment ago, we've got the highest growth that's been experienced across the country. But in addition to that, we now have the lowest student loan default rate ever recorded in Ontario. We brought back grants. Ms. Horvath's party, when they were in power, they eliminated grants. There's also capped student indebtedness at $7,300 per year. That means that if you borrow money from OSAP, doesn't matter how much you borrow, you're not going to owe more than $7,300 every year. So we've done a lot to ensure that there's more affordability and more accessibility. You know, this is... this is That's it. More affordability. M not all. And more accessibility. Not all. But those years in Argentina must have been pretty good for those people, you know. When everybody could have gone out there, had a job, all the teachers well paid, students with plenty of <laughs> provincial bond money to spend. I mean, uh, they had a taste of it. They succeeded wildly and it's such a shame that our Canadian world just don't seem to catch on to the Argentine solution. This, this is personal to me. My grandmother ah. was married at the age of 16. She didn't even go to high school. The reason that I'm standing here this evening as premier of the greatest province in the best country in the world is because of educational opportunity. Yeah, education's That's good, yes, yes. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Equal opportunity from a yes, worker, yes. Equality, Ontario, yes, sir. Yes, sir, yes, sir. For Mohammed, for students uh, across uh, our province. 
Now, there's no doubt it's expensive in the post-secondary system. Things are bad. So I'm going to increase access to OSAP to help make sure that we all have that opportunity, that great equalizer that's a degree, a diploma, or a trade. He's going to make. He's going to make sure. Here's the difference between the Ontario PCs and our change book plan and my opponents. We have an unrelenting focus on job creation to make Ontario the best place in Canada. <laughs> They're focused on job creation, even though they have no money. Now, what are the odds of being able to create any jobs when you have no money? Okay? And that's what they're focused on, though. Not a clue as to where to get more money, but they're full. Well, they're looking for dips over here to provide them over there all the time. Okay? Zero-sum game with these boys. Canada, when you graduate, you get a job. You know what, Mohammed? I've been there. I remember coming out to the economy from a university degree. I was stacking beer at the duty free store. It was a job, I was paying the bills, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. I will fight each and every day for our young people like yourself, Mohammed, to have a good job, to keep that great... He will fight for a good job. He won't find your paycheck, but he will fight for jobs. <laughs> Meaningless <laughs> rhetoric. This is the end of the fifth question. This is the last question. Last question, the thank evening. you. The polls tell us all the time... The Shortage of money? ...is health care, and that's what this question is about. Roll tape, please. Okay. I'm Lola Makani. I'm from Burlington, Ontario. I'm also a student at Ryerson University. My question is, there is already limited privatization in our healthcare system. Would any of the party leaders consider a larger role for the private sector in healthcare delivery? Okay, the one-on-one -on -one this time features Andrew Horvath and Dalton McGinty. Ms. Horvath, you go first. Now, I just want you to imagine how they could cooperate side by side, private clinics and big government hospitals, if there were enough money, okay? And that means that a doctor who can run his own machine on his own, you know, or a couple of doctors can be out there, while at the same time being able to afford the actual honest cost of going to use the hospital when they need to. So yeah, let the government provide the big machinery and let the doctors who use it charge the patients who are going to pay for it the actual true cost of the service in time and machinery, but not any debt service. Well, Bilal, I think that uh, the, the uh, healthcare system needs a lot of improvement. I think by changing uh, the priorities that we have now, we can bring back to Ontario the kind of health care that uh, the people... By change priorities, she means take from here to put over there. People expect uh, the kind of health care that makes sure that when a mom goes to an emergency ward on, yeah, yeah, yeah. on a Friday night... Should splash there over there. ...sometimes Saturday afternoon with her child. We need to change the priorities. We need to make sure that we are putting uh, investment into long-term care because you know what? It costs $1,200 for a person to stay in hospital uh, when they could be in long-term care uh, for about $160 a day. And in fact, with home care services, it only costs $60 a day. So we think that there's a lot of work to be done to change our priorities. Do I think the priority is uh, to add uh, extra uh, profits into the system? No, I do not believe that that's the way to go. I do believe that we need to cap the uh, salaries of, of CEOs in hospitals. Uh, unfortunately, okay. right now, the priority... And I consider that nickel and dining, okay? ...is that those CEOs get their six-figure salaries uh, while, uh, while we see nurses being laid off and emergency, being, emergency wards being... And if the nurses weren't being laid off, then no one would care, would we? But then again, the nurses aren't bright enough to demand to be paid in provincial bonds, except for the previous health care worker with the birthing mothers. And uh, maybe they just don't deserve it. Closed. So a combination of changing priorities and investing in, in programs like long-term care, like home care, like our new uh, housekeeping uh, uh, assistance okay, program for seniors. Well, I, a chance to get this Mr. Beginning, mm -hmm. um, I want to thank Bilal for that question. And I think it's a very, very yeah, important good, good, good question. It has to do with the future of our, yeah. of our public health care system, yeah. our Medicare. And there's going to be an important event coming in the not-too-distant future. The Premier of Ontario is going to have to sit down with the Prime Minister of Canada and 12 counterparts from across the country and hammer out a new health accord. I was there back in 2004 when I hammered out that accord with then Prime Minister Paul. How are they going to share out the shortages? <laughs> Martin, it wasn't easy. There wasn't pushing and some shoving, but in the end, we succeeded on behalf of Canadians and indeed Ontarians. The plan at that time was to ensure that we worked within Medicare and to ensure that we reduced 
uh, wait times and provided more access to more doctors. Here in Ontario, we have been we have enjoyed the greatest success of all. We now have the shortest wait times in the country. Oh, Hips and knees and MRIs and CTs and cancer and cataract care. We have the. You notice they've got all the same little few splashes they can ever keep talking about and repeating and repeating. And then the same complaints about the dips of the other guy. It's always, he's dipping over there and I'm splashing over here and aren't my splashes good and aren't his dips bad. And they do this to each other, okay? They never talk about where they're going to take. They only talk about where they're going to put. Anyway, how many times can they repeat it? shortest wait times yeah, yeah, in the yeah. country. Again, again. We've also ensured that 1.3 million more Ontarians now have a family doctor. Yeah, yeah, but this yeah. is the important point. I want Ontarians to ask themselves, who do you want sitting at the table with Prime Minister Harper when it comes to standing up for public health care in Ontario? I'm not saying that public health care is perfect, but I think there's all kinds of room for exciting innovation inside public health care, Ms. Orban, and that's, my, that's, that's where I intend to be. And he just never bothered looking into it until eight years into his mandate. Well, I think uh, I think that it's uh, it's clear that uh, Mr. McGinty is not talking to the same Ontarians I'm talking to. Everywhere I go, Ontarians are. Well, of course not. They all go in front of their own bunch of clappers. When was the last time you ever spoke to someone who wasn't one of your clappers, my dear? I mean, they're all your clappers. Telling me that they're watching their healthcare system erode before their eyes, and whether it's the Anzavino family uh, in Fort Erie, yeah, who had a, a daughter yeah, in a car yeah, accident, yeah. and that woman had to travel passed two closed emergency wards before she could get treatment, and she didn't make it. This is the kind of health care system that people in Fort Erie and Port Colborne are dealing with, along with another a number of other smaller communities that are having their access to emergency wards closed. We yeah. see with Yeah, running out of money is hurting people. She's aware. Women uh, who are taking breast, uh, breast uh, cancer treatments, who are losing their nurses. Ouch, that dip hurt. CEO in the London Hospital got his raise that year, but the nurses got... Oh, he got a big splash, but the nurses got a dip. ...cut out from helping women uh, cope with their breast cancer treatment. Uh, the kind of health care that we have in Ontario uh, is not the rosy picture painted by Mr. McGinty. What people are telling me uh, very clearly is there needs to be a lot of improvement. We have wait times in emergency rooms. Yes, I think we all agree eh? there needs to be a lot of improvement. That's deep. Uh, that, are, uh, that are beyond the pale. Uh, this is a promise that, uh, that Mr. McGinty's made in the past. My own son ended up with a skateboard oh. accident uh, oh. several weeks ago. He went to an emergency ward uh, in my community. Uh, they, they didn't do anything for his fractured elbow. They sent him home, so they, they, it doesn't really need anything. They can't afford a cast uh, and go home and somebody will help you figure out how to put a sling on it. Actually, she got criticized for saying this because that was the kind of fracture where you don't put a cast on. So she had to bite that one. That's not the kind of health care Ontarians deserve. We afford yeah. a cast and go home and somebody will help you figure out how to put a sling on it. That's not the kind of health care Ontarians deserve. We need to improve our health care system and we have okay, the plan to do that. Well, we need to improve it and we have the plan. The question is, who do you trust to actually start making the, the changes that put people first and put patients first? They have the plan to put people first but no money. First of all, I hope your son's well. Secondly, I don't, think, I don't think that's a fair representation of the quality of health care services provided by our hard-working doctors and nurses and technicians. Yeah, she opened herself up there for him to now get out there and be the champion of the doctors and nurses, hard-working government civil servants. Administrators across the province. How dare she say that they're not doing their jobs well. The fact of the matter is we put a lot more money into health care. We built 18 new hospitals. We've expanded some 100 others. We've got more doctors and nurses. We've got a great new... Uh, uh, not enough and not all, but some. ...collection of doctors and nurse practitioners and nurses and dietitians that we bring together <sighs> called family health teams. We didn't have any before. Now we have 200. And they're caring for 3 million patients. We also have the first... Uh, 1.6 million still cannot cover this. ...nurse practitioner-led clinics in North America. We're putting 25 places here in Ontario. So we're doing everything we can to reach further into our communities and provide still better, better quality health care. The next challenge for us is emergency room wait times. We're at the forefront of Canada. Oh. We have uh, national expert. I mean, how many times has he talked about the emergency room <laughs> times, you know? Six, seven?
Is that his big claim to fame? So Santa, Ontario's right up front and leading on this score. It's not an easy thing to do, but we are in fact getting those wait times down in emergency rooms right now. Okay, that brings the one-on-one -on -one to an end. We now open it up to include Mr. Hudak, and I remind everybody that the question was about whether there's a larger role for the private sector in healthcare. Mr. Hudak. Well, I want to thank Bilal for the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, when it comes to healthcare, for me it's personal. He wants it. <laughs> I'm 43 years old. I've been lucky. I had good health. My little girl Miller, not so much. She was born early, spent some time, a lot of time at women's college. And then recently this summer, she was in the hospital for 26 days at sick kids. Sob story. And I saw how hard our nurses are working. I saw how hard our doctors are working, and they're run off their feet. Mm. And they say, can't there be a better way? More money would be a better way. And that's why Interchangeable Plan will invest $6.1 billion into our health care system. Well, ah, that's a pretty big splash. We are number one priority to support our nurses, to recruit more doctors to our province and encourage them to go to underserviced areas, to build more long-term care beds. In fact, 40,000 long-term care beds in our province uh, and to make sure uh, that we invest in home care and put the patient, not the bureaucrat, not the fancy consultant that got rich off of e-health, we'll put the patient at the center of our health care system. Without raising any taxes. Ms. Horvath. Well, I think the thing that frustrates Ontarians, and it certainly frustrates me, is uh, when the Premier you know, talks his game about all the investments, the problem is that people are not experiencing improvements in their health care system. And so you have to ask yourself, what is going wrong? If all of this new money is being poured in, uh, then there's obviously a problem uh, because it's, it's not uh, reflecting in people's uh, confidence that their health care system is going to be there for them when they need it. And she's an expert on things that aren't working. That's certainly the, uh, the experience of Marita DeVries. That was the experience of the Anzavino family. Yeah, that was the experience yeah, of my own son. Yeah, that's just the experience no of the, the couple from uh, Sudbury who at, at, after 65 years of marriage are being told they have to go into separate long-term care homes. Look, the more profit you build in, I'm going to be really, uh, really frank with Bilal. I don't believe building more profit in is the right way to go. And unfortunately, both of these fellows uh, have, uh, have, uh, seem to have that kind of uh, a preference. Uh, I don't. I think we need to make sure uh, that we're investing okay. in the kinds of services like long-term care, home Mr. care, Mr. keeping Mr. seniors safe at home, frontline Mr. services. Mr. Not this is where she thinks we should be splashing our money in all these wonderful places. CEO salaries at the hospital. Thank you. First of all, with respect to our commitment to Medicare, you will know that we were the only province that on our watch put in a specific piece of law which commits Ontarians to the future of Medicare. That's the name of the very bill. Itself. All right, they made a commitment. But home care, Mr. <laughs> well, when it comes to home care, uh, Ms. Horvath, you will know that our commitment, our plan calls for an investment three you times. You changed home care into largely a private sector. Here's my concern. Here's my concern. Model, and you know Here's my concern. When it used to be largely Mr. Hudak not says, Mr. Hudak says that health care is his number one priority. A moment ago, he said education was his number one priority. So here's my real concern. Mr. Hudak has not had his plan costed by an economist. He's had no independent verification brought to bear. Economists, the guys who got us into this mess. On his numbers. Well, we've looked at his numbers. In fact, there's a $14 billion shortfall. No, hold on. <laughs> All right, well, you can bet they're each going to diss the other guy and say how big his hole is in the dig, right? What's the you, size you know of the previous piece of this shortfall? You know that $14 and billion what happened back then? Is that they closed 28 hospitals. There was war in our schools. We've moved beyond that. We haven't had a single strike in our schools in eight years. Class sizes are down, test scores are up, graduation rates are up, our kids are doing better than ever before. And when it comes to health care, again, I say to Ms. Horvath, I know the system is not perfect, yeah. but the fact of the matter is we are making real progress. Okay, Mr. 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 Dalton, you know that uh, your allegations about this whole have been discredited. And if you disagree with it, then, then why? The allegations about the hole in his budget, the promises he's made in excess of the cuts he's made, he says are wrong. Although all we've heard tonight from him is where he's going to be spending money and where he, not where he's going to be cutting. Did you adopt the exact same numbers we have for revenues, for health, for education? And if your numbers are so great, why did you have two sets of numbers in the last three weeks? Here's our plan when it comes to health care. 
will strengthen our public, universally accessible health care right. system. Okay, he's going to strengthen. With an initial investment, $6.1 billion oh. through a mandate. It will be our number one investment priority. Yes, yeah, And, you know, we see these ads from Mr. McGinty on TV where he claims that things are going so well in health care. I just didn't. 6 point one. I hear that from nurses, oh. from doctors. I don't hear from patients. And there's really one word we need to remember. E-health. A billion dollars that went down the drain, that went to the pockets of fancy consultants who then chose to bill taxpayers for their chocobites and their teeth. Sir, the billion dollars in e-health could have built four hospitals by now. Good response from Mr. McGinty, then Ms. Horvath. By all means, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the whole issue of e-health because uh, my colleague, Mr. Hudak, has been engaging in a fanciful fiction. I just want to quote back to him the words of of the Auditor General, because I think they're pretty important when it comes to these things. He talked about the $1 billion, and in fact, he was once asked at a press conference about that, that $1 billion all kind of evaporated, as Mr. Dudak would have us believe. He said, that money is going to turn out to benefit taxpayers. The fact of the matter is, this investment in electronic health is very important to all of us. So far, we have electronic health records for 7 million Ontarians. By the end of next year, we'll have those records for 10 million Ontarians. We're getting rid of, in fact, we've got rid of all the film that used to be used in our hospitals so that when they move information from one department to another, it's now done digitally. More than that, we're now ensuring that we can move that information from one hospital to another, one part of the province to another. So, notwithstanding Mr. Hudak's disparaging commentary about our electronic health system, we are, in fact, getting good values of this. It's really important that Ms. Orban went forward with it. Ms. Orban. I'm going to go back to Bilal's question and state very clearly that I am 100 percent uh, behind a public health care system, uh, one that puts patients first. And I yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. They yeah. are with me on that, and they have to ask themselves a, a simple question. Is there anybody who disagrees that the system should put patients first? I mean, as if the other guys are against that. How many times is she going to repeat this? Question in about uh, eight or nine days' time. Who do you trust to keep our public health care system in shape and there for you when you need it? So she ducked the issue completely, okay? She ducked the issue completely. Mr. McGinty seems to think that e health was a big success. I just don't think families believe Del McGinty anymore. A billion dollars. They could have built four hospitals. Ah, uh, how many times is going to repeat? Could have been four hospitals, and McGinty says having these records organized on computer is worth it. I seem to agree with McGinty now. You know, I like the idea of my records being available that way. We had consultants charging twenty eight hundred dollars a day, and then billing for their tea on top. Well, that's and then abuse. Mr. Sure, yeah. yeah. To give the e-help bureaucrats a merit pay increase for one of the biggest scandals in the history of frauds. Let me tell you one more thing too. Allowed where I disagree with Mr. McGinty. He's created these regional health bureaucracies called the LINs. Basically, a bloated layer of middle management that gets between the Ministry of Health and doctors and nurses and the patients they're trying to care for. $300 million to date sucked into this bureaucracy. People don't spend a single minute with patients, they don't do any surgeries. As Premier, I will close the doors in those wasteful LINs and put every penny in the bucks a minute you know? left here, so 30 to each of you, please. Right, in a matter of LINs, I just want to simply quote Conservative. Senator Dr. Willie Keon, one of the foremost cardiologists in Canada, and he said this with respect to Mr. Hudak's proposal to eliminate our local champions in Linz. And I quote, this would be the stupidest move I've ever heard in my life. It would undo years of progress. Linz, Linz manage health care within the community, they establish priorities. That's why they're so, so important to all of us in our hometown. Henry Horvath. Uh, New Democrats, I, if I become the Premier of this province, will make sure that CEO salaries are capped and oh, that money is invested God. in patient care. I'm going to cut, uh, get rid of uh, the wait lists for long-term care uh, and home care. I'm going to add a new program. She's going to splash here, splash there, spend money there, spend money there. To help seniors stay safe in their homes so they can stay in their homes longer. And I'm going to cut emergency wait times in half. And I'm going to proudly do that in the context of a public health care system. Oh. Okay, leaders, that is our time for the official debate tonight. But uh, according to rules, you each get to make a closing statement. And we have drawn lots, and Dalton McGinty, you get to go first. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, when a global recession hit Ontario, it hit us hard. So we rolled up our sleeves and we got working together. 
We invested in new jobs. We raw, in raw, raw. Training. We came with the support of the auto sector. We splashed here, we splashed there, there splashed there. We helped those people. Yes, the fact of the matter is, the economy is turning around. We are on track. We are headed in the right direction. We're now the number one producer of cars in North America. We're the number one producer of jobs in Canada. But there's still a lot of uncertainty in the global economy. The last thing we need to do is raise taxes on our job creators by $9 billion. And the last thing we want to do is start canceling international contracts when we're trying... All right, so he knows the last things we should be doing. ...to secure new international investment here. We've got a smart plan, it's a sensible plan, it's a serious plan, it's suited to the times. I hope you'll see it that way. I ask for your support. I thank you for tuning in tonight. Tim Budak, I want you to ask yourself, the first... Thank you, Stephen, and to my two colleagues and folks for listening and watching tonight. Ask yourself, can you afford four more years of Dalton McGinty? Uh, Particularly if there's storm... I mean, this is so standard. Every election, it's, the other guy's so terrible, you may as well vote for me. I didn't actually offer you anything different, but anything's better than him. He's that bad. I'm not as bad as him. <laughs> Clouds on the horizon. We saw what he did last time. He increased taxes on families despite promising he wouldn't. He increased taxes on business and drove hydro bills through the roof. That weakened Ontario at a time of need, and we lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs as a result. We need to chart a different course. I want to see Ontario that is the best. Not how to chart a different course, but now what he wants to see where we're going without telling you how to get there. What he wants to see and what we need. Place to find a good job. Our plan will create jobs in our province. We'll give families relief and get government focused on the basics, health and education. If you want that kind of change in Ontario, I ask for your support for your Ontario PC candidate on October the 6th. Thank you. Henry Horvath. It's kind of shocking how they can get on TV and make promises they have no clue how to keep. It just makes you want to... I want to thank the uh, six people that we heard from today as well as the thousand or so that uh, submitted their questions. You really hit on what's on the mind of, of most Ontarians. And I yeah, yeah, not enough money, every single issue. I appreciate that. I think that it's important to acknowledge that there's a big choice to make on Election Day. You can choose the status quo that hasn't been working, or you can choose a party that's going to put patience first. <laughs> So you can choose a status quo that's not working, or choose a party that hopes for better. This would have put jobs first. This would have put uh, the affordability of everyday life at the top of the agenda. New Democrats are offering the kind of change... Is that going to help you if you don't have a paycheck, that she's put affordability at the top of the agenda? That does exactly that. So your choice is a, is a very important one, but it really is a simple one. Uh, you can choose one of the same old suits, or you can put, choose the kind of change that puts people first. Oh, have, God. Choose change that puts people first. That's for your support on October 6th to change this province. Thank you. <laughs> and that ends our time in this debate. I want to thank the leaders for taking part. I want to thank you for watching, and we hope that you will go out to vote on the 6th of October. I'm Steve Pagan. Good night, everyone. Boy, did they put together a boring presentation. All no money problems, all the same repeated answers about where they're splashing now and where the other guy wants to dip. And what a... Anyway, you've now had a bit of an experience about uh, how the provincial bonds would have solved all the problems that these people are trapped by. And it, it just shows a superior of the high-tech engineer over the low-tech leaders. Okay, so there you have the leaders debate. And before I say my final word, I just want to remind you of these two ladies who gave us the quotes earlier, who showed such intelligence in being able to grasp that being paid with provincial bonds is decent money. So, would you take a pay raise in provincial bonds if nothing else? If we actually had a system whereby we had an alternative currency, yeah. like the Kingston Hours or the Ithaca Hours, that right. was actually functional yeah. and you could use for real services, yeah. I think we could really revolutionize our economy. If it was actually functional as a currency in our modern economy, yeah. absolutely. Good girl. What's your name? Kelly Gaspar. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I'm Kathy Penza. Okay. Now, did you ever hear what the Argentines did when they ran out of money? In, in 1980s, what they did was the unions said, you're not going to lay us off. 
you're going to pay us with small denomination provincial bonds. Now, if we printed $10 provincial bonds that you can use for hydro, for taxes, for health care, for fees, would you take an increase in provincial bonds, if nothing else? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, my dear. That's the idea. Okay. <laughs> so there it is. The Argentine solution of paying unions, government employees with provincial bonds creates enough currency to put everybody back to work at useful employment. Now, the solution is there with the two-minute video at YouTube. And uh, if you go to uh, johntermel.com slash poppers, poppers.htm, you can have all of these videos that are listed there during this election. So there it is, John the Engineer, the high-tech choice versus the low-tech choices you heard today. I hope it was as much fun for you as it was for me. This video was authorized by the Chief Financial Officer of the Popper Party of Ontario, Mama Teresa Termel, still alive and kicking, even if only with one foot. This video was authorized by the Chief Financial Officer of the Popper Party of Ontario, Mama Teresa Termel, still alive and kicking, even if only with one foot.